Hello. Hey, bye. Uh, welcome. Nice background. Yeah, I'm not sure where that is actually. <laughs> oh, I do know where it is. <laughs> Well, I, I had I originally had my uh, my castle room background, uh, but everybody kept thinking it was my ancestral home. So, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, at least it's a good way to get you know people relaxed and comfortable, right? Everyone has something goofy to talk about. But yeah, <laughs> there was a guy. Hey, oh, hey, Nick. Hi, Nick. Hey, thank you, thank you very much for uh, getting this this focus on uh, on you know. The invertebrate side of robotics. I think that's that's really uh, really amazing. So thank you for doing that. I really appreciate it. Well, thank you. I mean, we we thought it was something that was you know worth doing, and at least I feel like I always have to justify this to funding agencies, to collaborators. So our thought was we get a bunch of people in one space, <laughs> make our put our best arguments together, you know, and then move forward with that. So I, yeah, I agree, and and it, and it's not always obvious why you know what the advantages are why why the invertebrate model system you know is unique so i think uh, getting together and discussing that between ourselves is also a great idea yeah you know i think i and you know i try and bring some of the biology from my side of things into this as well to help inform that but great thank you so much for doing it yeah thanks for coming do you want to test slides or anything? Or are you comfortable with this whole routine at this point? <laughs> Should be fine, I think. I haven't got right. any uh, any concerns as long, long as we can share screen, which... Um... Yeah, you guys should all have permission. So they, the previous workshops yesterday, it was just a case of whoever's ready, unmute their self and uh, put their screen on and then share, share the screen and it, it seems to work okay. pretty well. Okay, great. Yep, I've got, just looking at my options. So we're sharing Michael's screen, right? Yeah, that's the background that we have at the moment. Yeah. Okay. But yeah, there's. I think everyone has full permission. So as long as we don't get someone determined to present at the same time as you guys, we're, we'll be fine. Hey, hi there. Thank you so much for coming. My pleasure. Hi, nice to see you. Hi, Dario. Hi, hi. So Joe, we're 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 almost adjacent to one another yet far away, huh? We only get to see each other on, on Zoom through some weird satellite link. <laughs> So I guess given this is the beginning, we should maybe give people to like five past or something before I do the intro. I guess we'll get a, yeah, a bunch sure. of people coming at the same time. Barbara, hello, welcome. Hey. Hello there. Great to see you. Thanks for joining us. Very right, nice to be here. Hey, Barbara. Hi. Good to see you again. How are things? Not bad. Not bad. Not bad, right? <laughs> I, I think that's, that's the most positive thing we can say in the current climate of things. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, but it, it's, yeah, life's okay. <laughs> All things considered, it, it's been fine. So. I'm trying to find my way to the UK in the next um, month because I, I haven't seen my mother in two years and um, mm -hmm. she's not getting any younger. In fact, it's her birthday today, her <laughs> 88, 88th birthday today. Oh, wow. uh, mm -hmm. And um, so I've really got to see her. So that now they've just uh, lifted the quarantine restrictions in, uh, in the UK. So mm -hmm. um, I'm going to start yeah. booking, booking they seem, tickets. They seem to sort of change them 
you know, they keep changing them. Every two days, they, they have another idea about what they should be. So, yeah. <laughs> but anyway, um, I'm sure you'll be welcome. <laughs> But Barbara, what is the what are the rules now? Can you freely uh, roam around or not really? <laughs> yes. Um, so it depends. It's a little bit different in in England and Scotland. We're not so in Scotland. In England, it's pretty much anything goes at the moment. Um, but mm -hmm. in Scotland, there's still quite a lot of re restrictions on you know numbers that can meet indoors, um, masks in shops, and stuff like that. Is still there, yeah. But the lab, the lab is again operating as usual or not? No, <laughs> it's it's open, so so students can can go in and, and use the lab. Um, there's still time restrictions, so they can't go in, you know, at any time of day or night as they used to, and a lot of them aren't aren't going in, you know, if they don't need to. They're they're working. We're still encouraged to work at home if we can. Right. Okay. What about so you, but you, can, you can have 100% uh, presence of or 100% of capacity if you wanted to? Uh, not again, no, because um, I think so. Student offices, for example, they're not allowed at the moment to have the same numbers in them, but that, that could change very shortly. Okay, yeah, they're waiting to yeah. see. Well, it's very comparable for us, so anyway, let's hope we get through this soon. Mm -hmm. Right, so should I just get the ball rolling then for this workshop? Yeah, we're all good, Nick. Um, you can just keep admitting people. So yeah, just a very quick introduction as like an overview to the aims and how this is going to work. So thanks for everyone for attending. This is workshop four of the Levy Machines workshops and this is titled Invertebrate Robotics. Just to give you some background, the real aim that we're trying to get at today was the, and this is the 10th anniversary, uh, anniversary of the Levy Machines Conference. So we wanted to take this opportunity to celebrate um, the achievements in the last 10 years um, in this uh, specific area of invertebrate robotics, and maybe to spend a bit of time discussing um, what we can expect out of the next decade in terms of where we, where we see opportunities and where we also see challenges. In terms of organizers, we've got Nick and myself today. Um, we're hopefully going to sit in the background more than anything, sharing these things, but letting the speakers actually do a lot of the presentations. But if anyone has any technical issues or anything like that, feel free to ping us on Skype or uh, on the Zoom or the Discord channels. In terms of our schedule, and um, we're going to kick off with our keynote speaker, Dario. We're then going to move into two different sections of uh, shorter talks. We're going to start with in invertebrate morphology and motion. And then we're going to move to, uh, move towards invertebrate minds at different scales. And then at the end of the day today, we're going to come together for this um, panel discussion. Um, it could be quite interesting. Yesterday's panel discussion went on way beyond an hour. Um, we're not holding anyone to that. Um, we've scheduled it for half an hour, but let's see how it goes. And just in terms of general housekeeping, um, for people that aren't speaking, if you could please mute your microphone and turn off your cameras, that will save bandwidth. Questions can be asked at the end of individual talks if you just uh, raise your hand via the, the icon in Zoom, or if you went, uh, wish to post to the Discord server, Nick will share a link to that um, in the Zoom chat so that you can all log in and go there. The idea just for everyone, the reason that we're using Discord, I know it's a bit of a hassle to use two systems, is that will stay active after the meeting so people can keep their conversations going. It will save a record so that if we're writing anything afterwards, and people can get to it later on. Whereas in Zoom, if once we shut the chat, it would disappear. So, so sorry for that extra step, but that's the reason behind it. And I should say that talks are being recorded. In fact, we're already recording now and we'll get around to sharing that with you guys after we've had a, a bit of a break. Okay, so that's me. So what we'll do now is I will stop screen sharing and we'll switch across to Dario. So if you want to get your slides ready, Dario, um, what I can do is give a brief, uh, bio and whatnot if my other screen loads up okay um, so our first speaker today is professor dario floriano and he will know, uh, need no introduction to many people at this conference as he's been one of the most influential figures in this field and um, for uh, a sustained period well over the decade that we're talking about and um, so professor floriano is currently director of the Laboratory of Intelligent Systems at the Swiss Federal Institute of Technology at EPFL. And he's also the founding director of the Swiss National Center of Competence in Robotics. Um, 
He holds an MA in Vision, an MS in Neurocomputation and PhD in Robotics. He's also held positions in industry at Sony Computer Science. He's been at Caltech and Harvard. So he's been all over the world doing, doing this type of research. He's made pioneering contributions to the fields of evolutionary robotics, aero robotics, and soft robotics, and um, which I'm sure this is something we're going to hear more about. And these advances are also having real world impact, not just within academia, through two drone spin out companies, um, SenseFly and Flyability, and also not for profits um, in robotics at the uh, robohub.org. In addition, Professor Floriano has served as advisory roles to influential committees informing people like the European Commission and the World Economic Forum. So we're delighted that uh, Professor Floriano um, is able to join us today to give this keynote and a bit of an overview of invertebrate robotics uh, over the last decade. And we'll hand the floor across now. Yeah, thank you, Mike. Thank you, Nick, for the invitation. And uh, <clears throat> I see a lot of uh, friends and, and uh, first I work with uh, different places. And, and, and the thing is that some of these people uh, sitting over there, they, they have seen parts of this talk. There is new stuff also stuff that we published uh, just last week. Uh, but uh, what I wanted to give in this presentation is a little bit of an overview of, of instant inspired drones that, that we did with my lab over, over the years. And um, I tried to pack a lot of stuff into this presentation to give a sort of coherent, as much as I can, view of what has uh, been driving us. Um, but um, I had to make a choice. And at some point, I decided to focus on the uh, mechatronic aspects, the mechanical design, uh, the actuation, and uh, uh, the electronics and the perception, but from a, from a mechatronics perspective. Less, less than, a, than on a control um, uh, aspect, but I'm very happy to discuss the control aspect as well. Um, uh, and I will point to some directions where we'll be working on that. But let me focus on, on, on the title. So it's insect inspired drones, but it, you know, when I talk to people about insect inspired drones, they always think they, I, they look like insects that they do not. And this is an artist uh, rendering of, that has been driving my, uh, the research of my laboratory and inspiring hopefully new PhD students does that. They, they chose biomimetic uh, uh, insect inspired robots. Um, and we never did it really. Uh, but what this picture shows is, uh, shows a few aspects that we are interested in. And the first is the fact that if you, if you want to have a drone that moves um, um, in uh, environments where humans are and that does work with us and for us, then you must be able to understand that the drones must be able to cope at least with the surroundings, meaning obstacles, other individuals and humans. And so you cannot simply, uh, um, uh, you know, there are safety issues, there are collision resilience issues and the number of issues that we could cover today. And so the, the materials and the mechanical designs are a very important component of, of how these drones must be designed. The second aspect is the sensing. So these uh, drones need to perceive the environment uh, to some extent, and they need to communicate with each other and with humans. And so that's another area of research that we have been investing quite a lot, especially maybe a little bit more in the past than today, uh, but in, in different ways. Um, the third aspect that unfortunately won't be able to cover today is uh, the possibility of using swarms of, or large numbers of drones that autonomously coordinate and, and use vision to, to work together. So we've done very recent work of sort of vision, uh, visually guided swarming, but it's not instant inspired. And so I, I won't cover it today, but I'm happy to discuss it uh, in the questions time. And, and the fourth uh, thing that we are working on is, is the control of, of these drones. Now, uh, much of the control aspect on insect inspired drones that has been focused in my lab on, on optic flow driven control for a number of, of behaviors. Um, and, uh, and I won't have time to go into much into that, but again, I'm happy to discuss uh, work in, in that area too. So the talk today will be focusing on mechanical design and mechatronics aspects of, of, these, of these drones. And it goes, I cover stuff, maybe some of you have already seen. So, but I'll try to go fast. So on, on the uh, earlier work. So, uh, when it comes to perception, we know that insects use compound eyes instead of uh, 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 vertebrate uh, mammalian eyes. And, uh, and these compound eyes are used for a number of, or at least play an important role in a number of uh, 
important adaptive behaviors for this animal, attitude stabilization, collision avoidance, altitude regulation and landing, chasing, swarming, and even homing. And, uh, and we know quite a lot about the mathematics of optic flow. Um, and uh, we know a lot about the neurophysiology of optic flow. There are only a few synapses that um, um, uh, away between the optic flow detector, this uh, array of, of simple eyes, of these compound eyes, and the uh, muscles that control the, the, um, the, the expansion, the contraction of the thorax, which eventually uh, makes the insect flying insects fly through the environment. So the circuitry, uh, at least the early stages, the first two to three uh, layers are pretty much in terms of anatomy, at least uh, known. What comes next is a little bit less unknown. There is a lot of recurrent connections and lateral connections that probably is, is interesting to explore in, in future research. But we've been focusing on these first layers that is responsible for producing uh, the behaviors that I described earlier on. And so one of our earliest work was uh, more than 10 years ago. We were looking at the possibility of using insect inspired um, optic flow driven essentially uh, cameras, compound cameras made of a number of simple eyes, each pointing in different directions on the top of a drone. And what you see here in this triangular shape is the front uh, part of a, of a flying delta wing. And, and uh, uh, the, this compound camera is sitting on top of this flying wing. And we have the two eyes on the, on the two sides pointing sideways horizontally in order to avoid obstacles. And then as you move gradually towards the front, um, uh, we know that the, there is almost no optic flow in the frontal viewing direction because nothing changes essentially as you move forward. However, uh, you can use optic flow for avoiding the ground. So, if you go towards the ground, if the drone falls, the, or, you know, doesn't uh, apply sufficient thrust, it will fall towards the ground. Then the, 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 the ground will expand, generating optic flow that gives important information for the drone to pitch up again. So that's the reason why, as we move towards the frontal area of the, of the drone, we put the, these compound eyes pointing more towards the ventral side in order to provide uh, altitude regulation. So we have, um, six, uh, excuse me, seven compound, uh, uh, a, a camera made of seven simple eyes. There is a Logitech um, optic mouse sensor behind each of these cameras. It's a three by three um, um, uh, motion detector array, very simple one that, uh, that simply gives a signal about the direction of motion of uh, any feature that appears in the field of view of, of these uh, compound eyes. And the signals are then used um, uh, uh, in an insect inspired uh, fashion uh, to, provide, con to provide control to steer the drone around. So avoiding uh, moving the opposite direction to the maximum rate of expansion, uh, whether it's on the sides or it's on the ground. We tried a, a range of different algorithms going from algorithms that were produced by Mandiam Srinivasan, saccade based to other algorithms which um, um, uh, cancer, continuously cancer using the inertial measurement unit, the expected motion, optic flow motion from uh, the, so that uh, generates also rot rotary motion from the observed motion. Um, so I won't go into the details of this, I'm happy to answer question though, if you have, but essentially we put this uh, uh, compound eye uh, on this drone and, uh, uh, and then you see that the drone using only a few lines of code, I believe the, code, the total code size was probably 40 kilobytes, no more than that. Uh, this drone is capable of avoiding the ground, maintaining altitude, uh, avoiding obstacles. Um, uh, and um, yeah, it's, it's quite, quite robust as well. So, so that's, that was the first sort of inspiration instead of using um, um, complex cameras, bulky with uh, maybe um, a lot of info data that come that must be processed uh, as they do today with, uh, for example, deep learning, you can do optic flow computation with neural networks. There are great neural networks for doing that, uh, but it requires much more computation than what we have here. Now, eventually we had sufficient technology for making these drones autonomous. We're talking about more than yeah, 12 years ago uh, that, uh, and we did a number of projects with these drones that we decided to spin off a company called SenseFly. And, and 
actually one of the winning proposition at that time of our product was that um, we allowed a drone with a winged drone to land back to an operator at very close distance. We had a tolerance of approximately five meters uh, without requiring the operator to accurately control and remotely control the drone towards the, the, when it comes back, which is a very difficult thing to do, especially if you have a wing drone. So, so the drone that the company produced was, was used for inspection of large fields, photographic inspections. Today, uh, SenseFly is part of the Parrot Group and, uh, and is still the, uh, the world leader in all the major markets for um, uh, long range inspection using wind drones. So what the drone was doing was you launch it by hand, you shake it as, as you shake the drone, the, the national measurement unit detects there is a certain frequency of motion. It activates the propeller on the back. You just throw it in the air and then it would take off. It would reach altitude using GPS and the national measurement unit on board um, the desired altitude, say 150 meters. And then it would go out and map an area that you had previously defined on something like an iPad. Uh, then once it did it and it recorded all the images on the memory stick, then it comes back and that's where the difficult part comes. Um, now, if you have a quad rotor, you can simply go with the GPS on top of the person position and then you can slowly uh, um, uh, reduce altitude and land next to the person. Uh, GPS is very good for that. We have maybe one, two meters tolerance depending on the weather condition. But um, uh, if you are a wind drone, you need to uh, you need more space for doing that. So what the drone does is that in this case, we get a drone with the optiflow detector on the belly pointing downwards. Um, as the drone reached the operator after the mission, it would fly out approximately 50 meters and then uh, initiate a descending maneuver towards the operator using GPS on X, Y uh, coordinates and also on Z coordinates. But as the drone moves towards the ground, the Z coordinate GPS is not very precise. And so there it's, it fuses the information from the OptiFlow with GPS and it lands very close to operator doing a slight pitch up maneuver at the end so that it lands without damaging um, the drone itself. So that seems a very simple <laughs> thing to do, but it was a, a game changer. And it allowed these drones to be operated by people who are not experts. Today, regulations have changed. Uh, even for operating these drones, you need, you need a trained operator. Um, so things have changed. But just I want to show to you how we put in practice this knowledge in the past. And I must say that today, the company, uh, I believe, doesn't use any more this, this technology. They recently changed to LiDAR technology because LiDARs can be much more precise and, and they make them very small today. So, um, optic flow can, there are situations where optic flow may generate signals which are not precise uh, due to aliasing uh, effects. But yeah. Okay, so that was one. Uh, the thing is that we were very good for landing, but uh, if you fly in very uh, uh, confined environments, sooner or later there would be some uh, uh, collisions. Um, and um, if, if you have only those, uh, those few sensors. So you need more uh, panoramic vision. We know that insects have very large fields of view, views and the direction at which the individual lights point depend very much on the, eco, on the ecosystem where the, the insect lives and what type of behavior it displays. So we observe a huge variety of geometries of, of compound eyes, which is quite interesting actually to study. And, and so we said, okay, we need to find a way of fabricating compound eyes that come in much larger numbers in smaller packages and can be deployed in different configurations. And uh, in a European project, we um, uh, put together a manufacturing, developed a manufacturing method for such compound eyes, which you can see on this slide, which is composed of using, um, uh, it's based on using manufacturing uh, flat manufacturing technologies, which is very well mastered. So the compound eye uh, consists of um, four layers of different technologies. It's a flat printed circuit board that carries all the signals from the eyes to the uh, microcontroller or you know whatever CPU you have on board. Then you have an array, uh, a flat array matrix of uh, CMOS chips with photo detectors. These are, we use neuromorphic chips, which um, today are very much used in event-based cameras. We actually modified a patented design uh, um, uh, by uh, Toby Dalbrook, who is uh, here in Zurich. And uh, we adapt the design to mimic the uh, response 
properties of a particular insect, the uh, Drosophila. But other than that, it was just an event-based camera. Uh, we just made it very small so that we had only three photoreceptors uh, that would be able to could capture um, uh, features moving in different directions. It, they were dip, dis, uh, um, laid out in a triangular shape so they would uh, detect features moving along these, these, the sides of the triangles. And we had many of them. Um, then we had uh, a layer of um, optics. So we had a number of small optics so uh, manufactured on a flat surface. And then in between the optics and the, the neuromorphic uh, chips, the neuromorphic detectors, we had um, uh, a set of uh, um, small, uh, black, thin black films with holes that would prevent the uh, photons coming from one lens to uh, project on adjacent photoreceptors. So just like in the insect, there is this uh, cone this of, of, um, of, um, uh, that, that conveys the photons down to the sensitive uh, uh, neurons. So here we had these uh, thin film polymers stacked on one on top of the other, creating effectively channeling the photons right down on the photoreceptor. So once we fabricated these three layers, we perfectly aligned them on top of each other. And then we, we cut them in columns and we bent them around the surface, which would be the head of the insect or of, of drone, which encapsulates the brain of the, of the microcontroller. And in doing that, uh, we, uh, with my collaborators here, you see some, some of the, I always show the picture of my collaborators uh, that did most of the work in here, of course, they did the work. Um, the um, technology, with this technology, we could manage to manufacture this um, uh, small compound camera um, that uh, um, was, yes, larger than the insect eye. This is an admittedly quite large insect. Uh, but um, uh, it's 10 times larger, but still we have, a, uh, we could manage to package 700 dies, single eyes, with a total weight without a scaffolding of 0 0.36 grams and a thickness of less than one millimeter. So this was quite an achievement. Uh, this was work done in collaboration with um, uh, Stéphane Violet and his team at the University of Marseille. And then we had the Fraunhofer Institute in Jena for the micro optics and then uh, 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 Tübingen University for all the optic flow algorithm. Uh, um, and so this was quite an achievement. It turns out the very first evidence for uh, compound eyes in the fossil record are eyes that uh, were actually cylindrical like our eyes and uh, were used by the trilobites um, about living 250 million to 500 million years ago on the ocean floor. So it's quite interesting. The first compound eyes were cylindrical like, like our eyes. So you may say, okay, what about if you want to make com spherical compound eyes? Well, we came out with a variation of this design, which is a completely flexible PCB laid, layered with, with these uh, small eyes with the, with the optics embedded that can be flexed and bent. And so you can manufacture uh, compound eyes like the sphere. I'm not sure if you can see my mouth, but on the top right. Um, and the, the important thing here is in order to fill the gaps between these layers, of compound eyes bent around, around the sphere is that every eye, we have triplets of small eyes and each one is has a slightly um, a tilted, um, actually I should not say tilted, slight uh, uh, switch the visual, visual direction so that one points directly in front, the other one points to the side, another one more to the side. So we completely cover the space. And so one can imagine in the future we could use this technology uh, we, we call these vision tapes because they're super flexible. You can glue them around any structure. We even have a sensor that can detect automatically the curvature of the sensor and, and automatically tune the optic flow algorithm to know in which direction each of the eye is looking at. We could imagine we could stick them at, at the edges of, of these uh, drones, for example, to provide periphery vision and obstacle avoidance while you use conventional cameras to do, for example, stereoscopic vision. And it turns out that some insects like, like um, spiders use this strategy, this combination of compound eyes with eyes that have many more photoreceptors on the back to do different tasks. So this is something that it would be very nice to explore. We haven't done that, but it would be very happy to explore in another European or, or joint project uh, if some of you is interested in this. 
Okay, so now uh, moving on from here, if you want to move into even more confined spaces, then sooner or later, even if you have the best vision, there would be collisions. And then the problem is that most of the drones, when they fall to the ground, they break down, but insects do not break down. There's this beautiful work by Bob Full where it shows that you can squeeze cockroaches and a number of other insects and their exoskeletons capable of to withstand huge pressures and then spring back in place. Work by Andrew Mountcastle and uh, Susan Combs, uh, at the time they were both at, uh, at Harvard University, showing that um, uh, the, the wings of, of wasps, when they encounter uh, forces, for example, during the collisions, which are larger than the typical aerodynamic forces they experience during flight, instead of breaking, they bend the give way. So there are flexion lines that you see here that are designed in such a way that the, the, the wing bends and then it springs back in place as soon as the obstacle has passed. So, and they can withstand thousands of, of, of these collisions without breaking. So this inspired us to design a new family of drones, which again, don't look like insects, but they, fall, they, have this, uh, they follow these principles. They are inspired by these principles. So it, it's a quadrotor, and maybe the best is to look at, at the video. It's a quadrotor that is composed of outer shell and an inner shell. The outer shell is super soft, and uh, in the, it, it's completely deformable. This is not good for flying. Uh, because you need to have a very stiff exoskeleton if you want to have the propellers to provide lift and controllability. But you know, if you have a collision, that's, that's great. It can deform without breaking. In order to provide stability, we have an inner core, which is solid and with magnets attaches to the outer core and provides stability to, to the exoskeleton. Now, the exo all these two blocks are connected by ropes. So if you throw it against the obstacle, you will see, let's see, in slow motion, the outer frame will deform slightly, and the inner frame was gradually, was slightly detached, allowing for the deformability, as you see here, and then uh, go back in place, helped by these springs that keep it together, uh, these cords that keep it together and the magnets. So this is a quite resilient uh, drone. Um, this is a video that one of my students, Adrien Brio, uh, took uh, while he was visiting Robwood, um, uh, lab in, at Harvard, uh, they were filming um, uh, house flies flying in very confined spaces. And when uh, Adrian brought back these videos, I was struck by these, uh, one, the exoskeletons, and including the compound eyes absorbing these huge co collisions. But second was also using the legs for uprighting themselves in flight and where they were on the ground. They, these insects were using a combination of the wings and the legs for uprighting themselves. And this inspired us quite a lot, including the most recent work that I'm going to cover that in a moment. The first thing we said, okay, let's have drones that have this, um, this is an artistic rendering, but they have this outer cage like the insect does that absorbs the collision. And one day drones, the drone is destabilized from a collision and falls on the ground because the propeller is tilted too much on one side and therefore it destabilizes the drone folds, then there would be detachable legs uh, on the sides that would upright the drone and the drone would be able to fly again. So here you see the, the prototype. The drone has no intelligence whatsoever except for a photo detector that, uh, that attempts to fly it it's attracted by the light at the end of the corridor. But other than that, it has no obstacle collision avoidance. It always um, 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 generates lift and tries to move towards the light. And when there is a collision, it falls to the ground. And as when it's on the ground, then the legs are deployed and it uprights the drone. So, so this is a strategy that works. No, no intelligence whatsoever. It's more morphological computation, if you like, than, than, uh, than brain computation. Um, however, the problem is that this drone uses a lot of energy just to cover this distance because of all the energy due to the fall and then uh, gaining again speed, altitude. The reason why this happens is that as soon as there is a collision with an obstacle, uh, even if this collision is absorbed by the outer cage, the drone can be destabilized. So the, the uh, thrust vector is uh, pointing in a different direction. And unless if you have a very good control algorithm, and today we have very good control algorithms that can cope with that. Um, but unless you have a very good control algorithm, then you fall on the ground. And so um, my students came up with the idea of, of adding a gimbal structure, a passive gimbal structure around the drone that would absorb the collision and freely rotate while the internal uh, structure 
um, uh, keeps flying, um, and the stability is simply maintained by the propulsive forces uh, generated by, by the propellers. And, uh, and uh, let me just... Uh, and using uh, as we use this concept I think the video might be cutting the bandwidth, Dario. Yeah, I think when you play this video, it's um, it's making your your video stream. Come out. If you could pause the video, Dario, I think it's it's cutting out your stream. Hi, student. Is that Dario cut out for you entirely? Um, yeah. I'm getting no. Oh, I'm getting you choose no. student. Uh, uh, Harry Burt is and uh, uh, postdoc. These elytras you can see in this picture are prote protect the main wing uh, called hind wing. Now, these protective elytras. They Design is a first version of these of these elytras on top of this throne, which is it will deploy these elytra structures by rotating them first forward in, in the forward direction, and then maybe it's, you can see uh, here, and then downwards so that the top right the throne creates the momentum. So that you can fall back. You can see the sequence here. The drone is upside down, so the belly is up. Um, the first thing is that the the elytra are positioned pointing forwards, and then they uh, pitch down, generating an upward motion of the drone until the drone goes back in the original position. Then they fall back in an aerodynamic uh, shape. And then they fall back. Um, I want to. Uh, show to you also with some anatomy test. And we looked at elytras of different sizes. Uh, what you see here in green, 17 centimeters, very long. Elytras in red, 14 centimeters. And short elytras of 11 centimeters. And we look at the uh, uh, 
um, benefits, cost and benefits of different sizes versus the uprising. So you want to be as long as possible if you want to go writing, but not as long as possible. It's just you want to be as long to write an uprising uh, movement, but uh, um, you still do not want to be too long in generative and lift. Because I have short time, what I want to say, maybe we can focus on this uh, um, graph on the bottom. But you see the drone uh, flying now in uh, flight regime um, without the elytra. So you can imagine a drone flying without the elytra. And here you see the lift to drag ratio. So you want to have a very high lift to drag ratio uh, when you fly. So this is what we get for different angles of attack as the drone flies. Typically, drones, wind drones fly between two and five degrees out of attack. And so here you see the drone. When you do pitch up maneuvers from the next landing, for example, approaching, then the drone pitches up even further. We know that uh, then some, to some extent, the lift to, lift to drag uh, ratios can be increased until then it goes down. But what you can see is that if you add the ETRA on top of our wing drone, you will see that the ETRA provide additional lift. And so they actually play a visual role uh, in the drone and they take off their added mass, which would otherwise create a uh, need for additional thrust in the drone. So they not only have this uprising capabilities, but they also pay off uh, their, their uh, mass cost. Where, um, you should see uh, how this works. So here is a very simple uh, use the idea for writing and then work. This is Hey, Dario, can you hear me? a problem, oh, you can't start your video because the host has stopped it. Can you still see my presentation? Yes, Dario, we see the slides. We were just hoping uh, that would reduce the cutting out. Uh, Sorry for that, sorry. thank you. Can you still see? Yeah, looks great. Okay, very good, yeah. Okay, great. So another problem is that we have is the problem of foldability. So if you want to create additional lift, then you need the larger mass, uh, excuse me, larger uh, um, air, air surfaces. You can also fly faster, but, uh, or turn, rotate your propellers faster, but that, that's, you know, there, there's a limit to how fast you can fly or how fast you can rotate your propellers. So most of the time, um, the manufacturers of drones tend to make these drones that are either large or they, you can take them apart for transportation like the EB Bison's fly. But if you look at the insects, what the insects do is that they don't, you know, they are in one single piece, but they have, they use these foldable structures that uh, can be released very rapidly for taking off. However, they take some time to fold back. So they have these slowly um, folding structures, wings, that can then store energy and this energy can be rapidly released for, uh, for takeoff. And so we designed a number of drones that, um, that have these uh, capabilities. Um, uh, uh, we look at uh, uh, origami uh, uh, designing for, for the arms of these drones, for example. Let me, for sake of time, simply show you uh, the, the video. So the drone is, has arms that are uh, made of origami. They have two flexures point uh, directions, one along the axis of the arm and another one along the uh, vertical axis for folding around. Let me see if I can move on to this. Uh, Okay, uh, you will see in a moment. So the propellers uh, at the beginning to unfold the wings, they must rotate in the same direction. So they generate the force that opens up the, um, uh, the, the, the arms. As soon as they open up, the upper side uh, folds back in place. There are magnets that keep it locked. And then as soon as the, the drone detects it is unfolded, two of the propellers will rotate 
counterclockwise and the other ones stay the same rotation and that provides lift and controllability. We also designed a, a version of this uh, that has a body um, made of a camera. So again, same concept, the propellers rotate in the same directions to unfold the wings or the arms. And then as soon as it's fully unfolded, it flies off. It turns out that the collision, the foldable versions on the left is always more collision resilient than the non-foldable version because of the design that we put in, but essentially a very compact drone that you can throw it in the air, it will unfold and then uh, uh, fly out. We also looked at the possibility of having folding wings, uh, just like insects do, uh, that uh, can fold in, and, and make the drone very transportable and then uh, unfold very rapidly so that you can launch them in the air. We took in particular inspiration from, um, again, a coleopter wing design where they have two main folding patterns. One is against the main body and the other, the other one is in the tip. And so Stefano Minchev, the main author of this paper, uh, captured that design in this origami design. Now what you see is a slow down version of the unfolding of the wings. We simply slide down the propulsive unit propeller in the front and then the origami structure will unfold very rapidly. As soon as it is in place, there is sufficient um, strength in the connections to maintain aerodynamic stability and the drone can, can fly off. Um, we had also a version of this, which is more elegant than the one that you have seen before, which is inspired by the structure of the wings of the insects, which is essentially made of, um, of two um, structures. There is the wings of insects is made by a number of small tiles, very rigid, uh, they are called cuticles, that sandwich uh, on the two sides an elastic pre-stretch membrane called resilin. So the membrane is pre-stretched by the, and it's embedded by these cuticles and the, 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 the periphery of the cuticles defines the folding um, um, directions of, of this wing. So we manufactured a, a drone based on that. We don't have time to go into the, the video. We also had this drone fly with onboard vision-based flight but in collaboration with my colleague David Escaramuz at University of Zurich. Unfortunately, <laughs> I won't have time to go into that. Let's stay with the mechatronics. Another problem that we are tackling in the lab is, uh, is last inch centimeter. Today, we have a lot of drones. Some of these are outdated that are used for transportation. And all, what we see is that the propellers are always large and exposed. And, and so the, the way in which these drones are used in, in industry these days, and we start to have commercial de deployment, is that they either require logistic landing space and charging space by trained professionals, um, or they load, they unload their cargo from, from the air with the winch and the rope until the cargo is deployed down to the ground, person grabs the parcel and then with the winch, the drone takes the, the rope off and then flies off. So they never get close persons, but parcel delivery, the way we are used to it is the post office are getting close and giving, giving you in your hand the parcel. And so we said, you know, how could we take, translate what we've taken from insects and, 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 and make it into a, a foldable drone that doesn't take a lot of space and is also protective of, of, of people. And so here, my uh, uh, former PhD student, now postdoc in my lab, Premac, designed this completely foldable drone with, with where the, the rotors are attached to the cage, to this origami cage uh, that uh, can be folded and unfolded. When it's folded, it takes very small space. You can put it in a backpack. And when it's folded, it folds around the cage, around the parcel. So you can send it to, for example, a person needing help. Uh, you can send an emergency kit. The, the person can just grab it, take the parcel off, uh, for example, the emergency kit, close the drone again, and then uh, the drone will fly back off to the person. So that's a, a use of this, uh, of this technology. Uh, and, uh, and here we have a new spin-off um, project. It's not yet incorporated, but um, I think it will be probably next year uh, for last inch, last centimeter transportation of, of goods um, in, uh, in crowded areas like urban environments to people. We have already deployed it on the PFL campus. We had students order 3D printed parts from the technical workshops and having them delivered to their location um, at the lab um, uh, using a very simple app. So we, we did extensive testing also with Ben and Jerry um, ice cream. We developed ice cream to uh, visitors on the PFL campus. So technology is quite good. Again, you, here you trade 
morphology or computation for morphology. The control system is relatively simple. It's only about navigation. And uh, we don't need to avoid P persons because you can get very close to persons uh, without any, any damage. Uh, the uh, latest iteration of this drone is, um, is probably is, is here, is a drone that can carry parcels of larger size than what you can encapsulate uh, within a drone uh, within the cage. And uh, uh, you can put the parcel on top of the drone and uh, uh, the drone, the propellers are uh, normally encapsulated within the cage, uh, but they can move out of the cage uh, so that they provide additional lift. So the problem is that when the, when the propellers are within the cage, the cage provides a little bit of drag. Um, it provides protection for the people, but it provides drag for the drone. And so when the drone flies up uh, in the sky away from the people, uh, here with this new design, we want to uh, put the propellers uh, out there, create creates more stability because they are further apart. And also there is no more um, interference with, with, the, with the grid. The drone is very efficient at flying. As soon as it reaches the destination, it goes between buildings and people, then it will retract again the propellers. I want to close with this last work that we did uh, with uh, Mark Kutowski, Kutowski at Stanford University. It's about using uh, drones for, uh, for, for doing forceful work. So for example, this is the Atlas robot. Uh, when we think about drones lifting, or excuse me, robots lifting or doing heavy work, we think about humanoid robots or heavy robots like the Atlas robot. But it turns out insects like, in this case, the killer wasp, the cicada killer wasp, actually can carry preys that, prey that are um, many times their weight. And the way in which they do that is they to leverage um, interaction with the environment to pull the prey uh, up, for example, the nest. And so uh, with one of Mark's students, um, uh, Matt Strada um, and uh, uh, Christiansen, uh, we combined their adhesive technologies, the microspines uh, with our drones and um, we created drones that have these microspines. The drone flies on the top of a building, for example. It has microspines on the bottom. It has a rope and a winch. And it lands on the top of the surface. And as soon as it's securely landed on the top of the surface, it can use the winch to uh, pull up a very heavy weight. Um, we also used uh, a different type of perching technologies developed in Mark's lab uh, to have coordinated opening of a door by two drones. So we have one drone that has a small uh, hook uh, that can slip under the door. The drone will then um, uh, go back. It will engage with microspine on the carpet. Then there will be another drone flying with a hook designed for the, uh, for the handles that will go and attach the handle. Then it goes against the, the uh, it pulls against the glass and there it uses another type of geek adhesive technologies against the glass. And the two drones then, they by combining their pulling down of the handles and pulling of the door, they can open this uh, um, uh, heavy door. So it's a quite nice coordination of, uh, of two drones, very minute drone to, to open a door. And, and uh, with this, I want to close this presentation and uh, um, uh, I want to thank you, it took a few more minutes <laughs> than, than expected, but I just want to tell you that, you know, insects provide a huge amount of inspiration because they are so tiny and they, they are great example of morphological computation where the, the, the shape of their body, the materials they use, uh, is used to solve problems that otherwise would need computation, complex computation and perception to solve. And that's the main message of my presentation. Many thanks for such a wonderful talk, Dario. Um, that was really good. And apologies for some of the, we seem to have some bandwidth issues in the middle of that. Um, just maybe one quick question um, from Nick, and then maybe we can catch some of the questions in the Zoom chat or in the, in the Discord. Uh, Nick says here, um, you showed many excellent examples of adding Electra, adding legs or fold foldability to drones. However, all these components add extra parts such as actuators or hinges. What approaches do you think will alleviate these problems of weight in the future? More left, later components, other things, etc. cetera. Um, yeah, uh, so the, um, I think that's a very good point. Uh, the thing is that, uh, oh, I'm able to start with you. So, okay, 
yeah, but I, I can I cannot show my face, but it's okay. Uh, so that's a good point. And uh, the the thing is, uh, for the elytras, we have thought about it, and indeed we are starting to look at structures that provide additional weight. But for the cage, uh, the cage provides additional drag. It's a price we have to pay for providing the safety. So I don't. I don't have a solution for that. We are looking at always lightweight materials. So in my lab, uh, we have well, many people are working on materials and we have instrumentations where we try to make as thin elastic as possible uh, and trying to use as few actuators as possible. Um, so to make this strong multifunction. But the, you're right, there is a price to pay in terms of added mass. Perfect. So I think we'll close there. We can maybe grab some more questions in the chat, but we'll hand over to Nick, who's going to chair this first set of mini talks. Yeah. So thank you. Sorry, it was a bit over time. Oh, it's, it's fascinating. I couldn't stop watching. Thanks very much. Yeah, wonderful. Absolutely wonderful talk. Um, so now we're going to jump into the um, shorter presentations. Our goal is for about 20 minutes for each of these. So speakers, uh, I may uh, send you a chat or maybe use the annotate tool to write on your screen when you have about two, two to five minutes left. So we can have a times for have a little bit of time for questions. Uh, so this this first uh, set of three talks is going to focus on morphology and motion. And then in the afternoon or you know the second segment is going to be more about uh, minds and control. So our first speaker is uh, Dr. Kotaro Yasui. Uh, he's an assistant professor at the Research Institute of Electrical Communication at uh, Taka. I'm so sorry, my screen just. Uh, yeah, at uh, Tahoku University in Japan. Uh, he's interested in the locomotor patterns of myriapods, and so you know centipedes and millipedes. And uh, he's interested in understanding the control mechanisms that underlie them. He builds phenomenological mathematical models of these animals based on behavioral experiments. And his talk today is entitled Decoding Flexible Motor Control for Mode-Rich Locomotion, Lessons from Amphibious Centipedes. So uh, without further ado, please. OK, um, can you see uh, the slides in full screen? Looks OK, uh, uh, thank you for inviting me to uh, this very nice uh, workshop. And I'm very happy to talk here. So my name is Kotaro Yasui, and I'm from the uh, Tokyo University in Japan. So uh, today I'd like to talk about the flexible motor control, uh, which we learned from the amphibious centipedes. So first of all, uh, our research motivation is, uh, I think, very similar to uh, the people in this community, that we'd like to understand the flexible motor control in animal locomotion to create the living machines. And uh, we basically take a uh, synthetic approach. So what I mean here is that we combine the biological experiments with the robotic validation. So uh, in my research, we first uh, performed the behavior ex experiments using real animals. And uh, based on the findings, we build uh, minimal mathematical models. And we, then we test uh, the hypothesized control mechanism by implementing it into the uh, real physical robot or uh, embodied simulation. So, so let's start, talk, start to talk about the amphibious centipedes. So uh, why we are focusing on amphibious centipedes. So uh, as you know, uh, centipedes has many legs and when they walk on land, uh, they mainly use the legs for walking motions, but when they are put into the water, they start to swim. And as you can see here, that uh, they basically fold the limbs along the body side and shows a beautiful bo lateral body undulation like an eels or snakes. And furthermore, when they escape from the predators, they so when they run, when they uh, walk faster or running, uh, then combine the uh, body undulation with the leg motions. And in, uh, furthermore, we know that when they climb up a, a rod like this, uh, they combine the body contraction with the uh, leg motions. So what I want to say here is that uh, the amphibious centipedes uh, have a versatile body and limb coordination patterns uh, in response to the situations. 
And so we think uh, this, the, the, they are suitable model to explore the flexible motor control in animals. So uh, what should be understood here? So um, the long history of neurobiology suggests that uh, the adaptive locomotion is generated uh, through uh, ma three major components in the neuronal uh, structure. So one is of course the higher centers uh, which includes the brain. And the other is the central, what we call central pattern generator, which is a distributed neural circuit along the body to uh, uh, re uh, produce the rhythmic motor patterns. And the, the, the final uh, third, third one is the sensory feedback. So uh, these components are very uh, important, but uh, the essential interplay between the three components still remains unclear. So to tackle this problem, I think the uh, centipede is a very good model uh, because they have an elongated and segmented body. So uh, this uh, body characteristics enables us to uh, easily observe the behavioral changes when they uh, transition between different locomotor modes and also when we look at the nervous systems, uh, we can easily uh, perform the lesion experiments. So we cut the nerve uh, connectives to see uh, how the each neuronal components interact each other. So uh, using this amphibious centipede, uh, we, uh, today I'd like to talk about uh, how we model uh, these three behaviors. So walking, swimming, and running. So there's three parts. The first one is the local uh, control circuit for walking motion. And then we try, uh, then we start to understand the mode switching mechanism between walking and swimming. And finally, uh, the third one is the very fresh data that we are trying to uh, understand the descending control from the higher centers. So in walking and running and swimming. So, uh, so uh, first, uh, this, uh, behavior, uh, this behavior experiment, we uh, removed uh, a part of the terrain during the walking. This is a side view. And when we see the legs over the gap, you can see that the periodic leg motions stops. So from this experiment, we found that the local sensory feedback based on the ground contact signals is a very important to establish the inter -limb coordination. And based on this finding, we built a simple mathematical models and we could reproduce uh, the same behavior in the simulation like this. Then uh, next, I'll talk about the mode switching mechanism between walking and swimming. So uh, first we conducted a behavioral experiment to see uh, how they behave when they transition between land and water. So the upper vid video shows the transition from land to water. So when we see this video, the anterior part starts to stop the leg motions and uh, start to body undulation. And what is interesting here is that when we look at the uh, hind part on the land, it continues walking motion even when the head part starts to swimming motion. So the locomotor modes uh, gradually change from the anterior section depending on the environment. And <clears throat> we can see the similar uh, behavior when they transition from water to land. Then uh, we conducted a nerve transaction experiment to see the role of descending control from the brain. So uh, in this experiment, we transected the nerve connectives in the middle of the body. So the front part 
is almost intact animal, but uh, the hind part cannot get the signals from the uh, brain. So what happens? When we put them on land, as you can see, the walking can be generated even in the hind part without the brain. So for walking motion, the brain signal is not necessary. In contrast, when we put them into the water, the anterior part starts to swimming motion, but the hind part does not show any uh, movement. So we found that the swimming initiation needs descending control from the brain. So based on these behavioral experiments, uh, we uh, hypothesize uh, uh, we built a hypothesized control mechanism like this. So <clears throat> the brain can select the walking or swimming mode and uh, the signals are sent posteriorly like this. And each body segment basically follows the walking or swimming signals from its anterior segment. But what is important here is that when a leg detects a ground contact, the signal of the ground contact, uh, the ground contact signals induces walking motion and override the swimming command from the brain. So using this uh, hypothesized control mechanism, we conducted simulation. As you can see in these videos, uh, we could successfully reproduce the transitional behavior from land to water and water to land. And also when we cut, uh, we conducted a nerve transected centipede, the hind part did not show uh, any swimming motions, but when it, 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 it was placed on the ground, it shows a walking motion. So this is the brain less walking patterns. So we could successfully reproduce uh, many motor behaviors in the behavioral experiments. So uh, now uh, the question is here is how can we model the running behavior? In the previous model, uh, we could successfully reproduce the walking and swimming motions, but running is not uh, running mechanism is not captured yet. And here we hypothesize that the for running the descending control signal is essential because um, when we see a nerve transected centipede, uh, the body undulation of the swimming uh, during swimming cannot be initiated without the brain. So. Uh, for running, uh, the body undulation is uh, similar to that swimming. So we hypothesize that the uh, uh, higher centers plays an essential role. So to investigate the functional role of higher centers, uh, we conducted uh, the uh, experiment uh, in which we remove the brain and subesophageal ganglion in a stepwise manner. So. The uh, in centipedes, uh, this is this figure shows the head ganglion in centipedes. So uh, the highest center consists of brain and a subesophageal ganglion. So we uh, cut them in a stepwise manner. So, uh, so what happens? So first we uh, remove the uh, brain. So this is the behavior without the brain on land. They walk very slowly and the body bending disappears. So it always shows a straight posture. And when we put them in water, uh, no co coordinated movement appears. Then uh, next we cut uh, the sub subesophageal ganglion. 
the left one is on land. They turn to show a uh, very fast walking, so running patterns. So you can see that the strong body undulations appears. And also in water, they shows sometimes a strong body bending. So from uh, these behavioral experiments, we updated the hypothesized control structure. So uh, what we found is that the subesophageal ganglion basically inhibits the rhythmic body bending. And also the brain inhibits the activity of the subesophageal ganglion. So the brain, um, inhib uh, brain can um, induce the body bending by uh, tuning the strength of inhibition to the subesophageal ganglion. And also uh, we found that uh, brain is essential for swimming motion. So the leg folding and body bending is uh, initiated from the brain signals. And the last one is uh, what we always see that uh, the leg, uh, leg motion for walking can be generated uh, by a sensory feedback. So it doesn't need uh, descending control from the brain. So using this uh, hypothesized control structure, uh, we also conducted the uh, simulation experiments and we can uh, reproduce the walk to swim transition. And the bottom uh, simulation video is the gate transition from walking to running. So first they walk slowly with less body bending. And now it starts to uh, strongly bend the body. So in this simulation, uh, note that we, we just changing the parameters of gain value for body bending. So uh, these are the, our latest results and I'd like to summarize my talk. So uh, this figure shows our conceptual uh, control uh, mechanisms. So uh, what we found from an amphibious centipede is that distributed neural circuits and sensory feedback can establish the, uh, each locomotor patterns. But uh, based on this structure, uh, even if we use the simple descending control, uh, it, can, it, it will be sufficient for adaptive locomotor transition. So uh, thank you for your kind attention. Uh, this is my talk. Yeah, that, uh, that was a really wonderful talk. Thank you, Kataro. I really, really appreciate it. Uh, I do want to keep us moving on time, but I do want to ask if anyone has any questions. Yes, I do. Go for it, Joe. Um, do you ever see these animals walk backwards? And if you can, can you initiate backwards walking with passive traction? Mm -hmm. uh, they don't show, uh, they, they basically don't show backward walking. Interesting. Yeah. Uh, all right, well, that was a quick question. So I want to ask a question too, if that's okay. Uh, you know, so myriapods seem to be a great model organism for studying interleg coordination. They got plenty of legs, which is great. Uh, and of mm -hmm. course, uh, modern arthropods are thought to have evolved from a myriapod-like basal organism. Uh, how, so I guess, how applicable do you think some of these findings would be to shorter arthropods like insects or decapods, because a lot of these things you're talking about are like really nicely in agreement with studies in these other arthropods. Mm -hmm. Do you, do yeah, you yeah, think yeah. these signs could be applied to models of other organisms, other arthropods? Yeah, yeah. So for interlimb coordination mechanism, we think uh, there, there are many uh, common principles uh, between the, for example, insects and uh, these myriapods. So uh, that's a very interesting topic to how 
the how we shorten the body and um, reproduce the insect behaviors. But uh, as I talk today, the sw swimming and the running motion is uh, the different body limb coordination. Uh, so the insect doesn't use such kind of behavior. But uh, when I think uh, there's a common control principle between the uh, <coughs> fly, flying and um, flying and walking in insects. So uh, basically in centipedes the uh, running and swimming is uh, escaping behavior. So um, I believe that there might be a common point to initiate the escaping behavior. Yeah, no, that's really interesting. I think this, you know, I'm glad that we're all talking about this, right? Because yeah, I think these different organisms all have different strengths experimentally. Uh, so that's great that uh, you can bring this to the table. So wonderful talk, thank you so much. Yeah, uh, I'd like to move forward much. now. Yeah, uh, I'd like to introduce uh, Dr. Barry Trimmer. I'd like, uh, you can get your slides going, Barry, if that's all right. And um, uh, Professor Trimmer is the Henry Bromfield Pearson Professor of Natural Sciences in the Department of Biomedical Engineering at Tufts University. Uh, there he's the director of the Neuromechanics and Biomimetic Devices Laboratory, uh, where they pursue three major research areas, the neuromechanics of locomotion, soft form robots, and the tissue engineering of novel devices. Uh, so his talk today is entitled, Crawling Critters and Robots, Robust Locomotion in Unstable Environments. Barry, the floor is yours. Okay, you couldn't hear me there. Can you hear me now? Yes. Yes. I'm, I'm on now. And you can see my screen, I hope. Uh, we see the other one. Would you be able to see switch the wrong which one? Switch? Yep. 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 So uh, just share my screen. Share the other one. Sorry about that. There's too many screens here. Hey, it's a good problem to have. I get it. <laughs> Uh, that should be better. Is that correct? Perfect. Perfect. Thank you. Great. Thank you. Okay. Um, so thank you, Michael and Nick, for uh, getting this uh, organized. I'm, I'm very appreciative of it. Uh, I've been working on invertebrates for a long time and, uh, and engineering and trying to think about robots for, uh, for at least uh, two decades. Um, and uh, I'm going to be talking about crawling. I think uh, I want to keep this fairly short. I'd like to really just illustrate a couple of lessons that we can learn from um, crawling animals. Uh, there are a lot of things we can learn, but I'm going to uh, concentrate on two, two main things. So um, the first thing is uh, that crawling doesn't get the respect that it deserves. Um, if we look at the uh, body mass of uh, invertebrates uh, against their speed, we see that, uh, of course, flyers and jetters are nice and fast for their size, runners, uh, and walkers are pretty pretty good. And this area here is crawling animals. They're pretty darn slow in general. And uh, in fact, you know, the limit seems to be somewhere around four centimeters per second, um, you know, regardless of, of size. So crawling seems to be the poor cousin of the other modes of locomotion. And, and it does raise the question of why do animals do it? And also why would we want to emulate this? Why would we want to actually crawl? And so just to sort of give you an idea, crawling movements are pretty diverse. Um, you know, the, uh, if we just look at these different, uh, different animals crawling here, we've got sort of an inching movement. Uh, you saw the really fast crawl over this side. Uh, up here is uh, a form of crawling in a, in a different uh, group of animals. And uh, one that's familiar to Barbara, of course, is uh, crawling around of diptera maggots. Um, in this case, uh, you know, maggots don't have legs. Uh, they're mainly burrowing around. Uh, these other Lepidoptera and Hymenoptera are moving around in trees and branches. They actually have legs um, on their abdomens and their thorax and uh, use those legs. So crawling are pretty diverse. It's not one thing. Uh, there are a lot of different types of motion. So 
what I think is, is important to recognize is that despite the massive difference in um, evolutionary paths that these different insects have taken, uh, common environments often lead to common strategies. So we can learn a lot about the way uh, to design machines based on these uh, fundamental principles that has been sort of worked out through evolution. Um, you know, the, the Drosophila here, which is crawling around and Lepidoptera over here, we think of them both as insects, they're both larval insects, uh, but you gotta remember they're about 260 million years apart in evolution. They are as different evolutionarily as we are from the reptiles, because that's around the time that mammals and reptiles actually diverged. And in fact, uh, when I was showing you a sawfly, which is a larva of a hymenopteran, they're even further back in evolution. One of the things about insects, soft insects that are moving around in terrestrial environments is that they're not entirely hydrostatic. Uh, they don't have high pressure inside and they can stay soft. So why crawl? Well, low impact forces. So you actually don't need to make stiff elements and stiff elements biologically are expensive to make. They're usually dense and heavy and uh, quite costly. And there's a big problem if you're an animal that needs to grow quickly. And we'll come to that in a moment. Uh, without a stiff skeleton, you can actually molt much more easily. So here we have insects trying to grow to be the adult stage, and uh, they need to be able to grow pretty quickly. And stiff skeletons are wicked expensive to, to build and then throw away. So uh, not having a skeleton is kind of helpful for that. Uh, also crawling stable, um, you know, we can define it in lots of ways, but essentially it means you've got a large proportion of your body in contact with the substrate. Uh, so it's, uh, it's, it's pretty easy to do and you don't have to have particularly good fast postural control. And you can also be very compact. Uh, you don't need to have long limbs, if any. The challenges, of course, are that with no articulation, but really high degrees of freedom, you've got to control those high degrees of freedom with a relatively few neurons. Uh, I don't like to say that they have simple nervous systems because they don't, but they do have fewer neurons than, uh, than most vertebrates. And so uh, you've got to be able to control all those degrees of freedom somehow. Um, Another problem is uh, that they're generally slow. That may or may not be a problem, depends on what, uh, what the animal needs to do. And they are definitely energetically inefficient. Uh, they tend to be quasi-static. So they're not carrying over uh, you know, momentum from one step to another, for example. So the reason animals are like this and are crawling around, particularly insects, is that they are slow and stable and they're compact. Uh, and I think the key to this is that it allows them to grow massively. Um, the animal I work on, this, this one up in the top right, is a tobacco hornworm. And in, uh, in less than 20 days, it grows 10,000 fold in mass. It's as if a baby human born weighing eight pounds was 80,000 pounds at the end of, uh, the end of three weeks. Uh, it's a truly astounding growth rate. So... What I want to do today is concentrate on just two lessons from Manduka in this uh, attempt to go from animal biomechanics and neuromechanics through to building robots. The first is use the softness. It's actually an, a helpful way of thinking about motion. Uh, when we build soft devices, we immediately run into problems of the softness. It actually creates huge problems in our design thinking. Uh, so what we have to do is get away from just putting hard things into the soft structure in order to get around those problems. We actually need to exploit the softness. And the second message is that the soft tissues can actually work as mechanical computers and help simplify the neural control. And this is something that Dario mentioned in his, uh, in his talk as well about uh, the morphological computation. Uh, I would advocate that soft materials, because of their complex mechanical properties, are actually performing more of that calculation than may be in articulated stiff animals. So the first lesson is really uh, an old one, but uh, one that I think is important. And I have to give credit to <clears throat> Y.T. Lin, who's a professor at Imperial College, a former student of mine, who really came up with uh, the data and the idea about this um, so-called environmental skeleton. What he did was build a, a force beam array 
across which the caterpillar could walk and we could track <clears throat> the ground reaction forces of each of the main locomotory legs in the abdomen. And <clears throat> what you're looking at is going from the back of the animal forwards in horizontal crawling. You're looking at the normal ground reaction force, which is not particularly interesting. It's basically uh, carrying their weight and the propulsive ground reaction force in the axial direction that the animal's going. The red lines, when they go underneath the zero is actually causing drag. They are resisting movement forward. <clears throat> and when they go above the line, they're acting to pull the animal forward. And the huge surprise to us was that the back end of the animal is actually, um, as you can see, is causing drag. Why on earth would the animal want to be in drag? And the answer is that it is trying to maintain its body in tension rather than putting compressive forces on its body. The compressive forces are being applied between the front end of the body that's pulling and the rear of the body that is drag. So in this way, it is actually a tension-based mechanism. It progressively releases tension then regains tension <clears throat> as it moves and it doesn't put compressive forces on its body. So that's an, in some ways an obvious thing, but we hadn't really thought of it that way until we started making these measurements. That if you're soft, then don't put compressive forces on yourself. Use the environment as your skeleton. The environment is stiffer than you are. The limitation, of course, is that this mechanism doesn't work when you're crawling on substrates that are softer than you are. So there must be a different strategy for doing that. Okay, the second lesson, and then we'll get to the robots, is that uh, materials are mechanical calculators. And uh, I apologize to those of you who've heard me sort of go through this before, but I think it's a, a very important uh, way of thinking about materials. Simple elastomers are pretty boring. Um, they are pretty linear. And if you think of this as, a, as some sort of calculation that's being done by the material, it's just a linear relationship. But most biological tissues and most elastomers are actually pseudo-elastic. So you have this uh, <clears throat> dependence upon the direction of the movement, whether you're stretching or compressing. So this hysteresis is a work loop and it's much more interesting from a computational point of view because the material is effectively translating one parameter into another in a complex way. So, you know, linear viscosity, viscoelasticity and uh, you've got creep and uh, relaxation and all of these parameters. And this, as long as it's an intrinsic feature of the material, is something that the nervous system can exploit to generate complex motions and to control the motions with simple commands, because you've got relatively few parameters you need to be thinking about. How does this work? Well, <clears throat> here might be an example. Um, what I'm showing here is a muscle that's been taken out of the animal. And uh, you can actually stimulate the muscle, as you can see, and control its movements using, using stimuli derived from the animal. So if you cycle the muscle through its natural cycling, so this is taken from an animal crawling, and we put it onto a control system, a servo system that can move the muscle through different lengths, uh, and we can stimulate the muscle at different times during its cycle of shortening and, and extending. And that's shown here. You can see that we are controlling the length of the muscle, measuring the force and stimulating at a particular time in the cycle. Now, <clears throat> muscle is really two materials. When it's passive and not being stimulated, there is one hysteretic work loop. When you stimulate it constantly, it gets much stiffer as we know, and it becomes a different work loop. If you now plot what happens during a natural cycle of, that would occur during crawling, you get this transition from one work loop to the other, and you get these really, really interesting figure of eight work loops. Of course, what's going on is that in one part, when the muscle is relatively long, you have a damping effect of the muscle. It's acting as a shock absorber or a damper. And that the shortened part of the cycle is acting as an actuator. <clears throat> this is intrinsic to the muscle. So nervous systems have never ever been separated from the body in which they're carried. So nervous systems have always, always had to um, contend with, but actually exploit and use these properties because they've never been uh, evolved separately. 
And I think what nervous systems are probably doing is shifting things like the timing and the uh, amount of stimulus that is being given. So uh, here we see the effect of varying the stimulus timing on this work loop. And here is the change in the stimulus duration uh, at different times. You get tremendous changes in these work loops. This would be considered a, an engineering challenge uh, if you were to build your actuator this way in a conventional machine. But I would argue that it's actually one of the ways in which you can encode uh, morphological computation into the structure. Uh, just to give you a quick example of what's going on here, and then, then I'll show some robots and hopefully be on time. Um, <clears throat> If we record the electrical activity driving the muscles in different parts of the body, uh, they're illustrated here as red patches or activated muscles, we find that the dorsal muscles and the ventral, the ones in the back and the belly, are actually co-active throughout most of the cycle of the animal's movement. So although you might think they're sort of doing a, an antagonistic, you know, up and down movement, they're really not. They're contracting together. And similarly, if you look across different body segments, you find that although the wave of activation of those muscles is progressing forward, so they're phase delayed, there's tremendous overlap in the activity of different body segments. So the lesson in this crawling is that it's really coarse. The encoding is extremely coarse, unlike what you might expect to see in a, in a stick insect where you've got quite precise timing and cockroaches running uh, and individual spikes may actually matter to their motion. I think when you're soft, because of all the damping in, in the body, being extremely precise is not at all important. And I think you get a lot of your precision from the mechanical properties rather than from the neural properties. We've been able to show that in, uh, by implanting flexor electrode arrays into crawling caterpillars, we can look at the firing pattern of particular muscles. It doesn't matter which ones they are here, but we can measure the firing of that muscle when it's being activated relative to the crawl cycle. And we find that during horizontal crawling, you might expect a work loop like this. And when the animal starts climbing vertically, you see a shift in the timing of the activation of the muscle which may well move into a different work loop. So I think this is the way in which uh, control is mediated by changing, broadly speaking, the timing, relative timing, rather than extreme precision. Uh, and we now know that uh, the muscle activation corresponds to the movements in different body segments, depending on whether they're horizontal or vertical. It's a simple lesson here. So in the last couple of minutes or so, um, I'd like to sort of talk a little bit about what some of our new robots that are inspired by the things we've been discovering in caterpillars. Uh, some of you might be familiar with our uh, 3D printed uh, shape memory alloy actuated software robots, which we're interested in using to learn about control systems. We also build them uh, by casting. Um, <clears throat> but more recently, we've been working on uh, what we think could be a prototype for a practical and functional soft robot that crawls. We call it monolith, it's untethered, it's highly versatile, and it's built primarily from foam. Um, <clears throat> so the structure, it's, you know, Toblerone shaped, triangular shaped for various reasons. We've got multiple surfaces on, on which it can crawl. Uh, the body is built out of a polyurethane reticulated open cell foam. Why is this bio inspired? Well, as I mentioned early on in the talk, uh, insects actually are not hydrostats. They are full of air tubes and they are compressible. And I find the idea of using compressible materials really interesting because it allows you to go through um, restricted spaces that uh, normally uh, other robots cannot go through. There's always a limit to how small a, an articulated robot can be. Uh, these robots can compress down even further. So it's very tough material, um, and it's very lightweight, 16 kilograms per meter cubed. You know, to give you an idea, steel is about 8,000 kilograms per meter cubed, and ABS plastic about 1,000. So it's very, very lightweight. Uh, it has lots of interesting properties. Uh, when you squeeze it, you get these uh, work loops, if you will, uh, and you can exploit the buckling properties at, at, uh, at, at short uh, compression. Uh, the deformation property where it changes its stiffness and it becomes densified when it's very, very compressed. So it actually becomes a stiff material. So that's very, very helpful. We use uh, tendons because we, um, we want to mimic the uh, tensile actuators of animals. 
Well, you can't push with a tendon. And we wrap this in a, uh, in a mesh. And that's how we attach the tendon to the body. And this is really emulating the way insects uh, attach their muscles to the stiffer parts of their body and the body wall. Uh, they actually distribute the stresses in, in, the, um, in the, the sort of uh, fibers of the, of the cuticle and body wall. And we use uh, embedded uh, plastic in, those, in, those, in that mesh. We simply have a, a traditional rigid uh, uh, part of the robot, which is, is at the back. Uh, it doesn't affect the deformation, so it's relatively, relatively uh, uh, OK to do that in a soft robot, uh, because we can now use traditional motors with spools and control the tendons. And I think this is one of the keys to making a practical robot that we're using off-the-shelf products here. I'd just like to show you, uh, finally, what, what this robot can do. Um, and uh, give credit to the people that actually made this, uh, Anthony Scavelli and uh, Cassandra Donatelli. Uh, this is in real time, it's not speeded up. Uh, it's, the robot is uh, probably about uh, 200 centimeters long, it's quite a big robot. And, uh, and it gets around by different crawling modes, so inching, uh, this sort of compression creeping mode. And uh, it also, can do a really interesting, interesting motion, which is, um, whoops, I'm sorry, which is this sideways rolling motion, which actually mimics what caterpillars do. If you roll a caterpillar onto its back, it does exactly this motion um, to, to right itself. This allows us to exploit the different sides of the body. We could put different types of uh, interaction systems on the body. Uh, underneath to walk on, on sand or other uh, types of substrate. And lastly, to point out from the very first slide that uh, you know, crawling doesn't get enough credit, uh, the robots that we've just built, here are some famous robots, the meshworm robots, some of our early SMA activated robots, and uh, Tolly's uh, wonderful massive pneumatic robot. Uh, they're all relatively slow still. Um, the motor tendon robots that we built, including monolith robots, are actually right up here. They're moving about with the same sort of uh, speed relationship that you'd expect for uh, runners and walkers. Um, so we think we're getting into the realm where they're practical. And I'd like to just thank all of the people that have been involved in this research. And if there's time for questions, that'd be great. Thanks. Really fantastic talk, Barry. Uh, thank you so much for uh, coming and sharing all that with us. Um, we, are, we are running a little bit behind, so I'm going to ask one quick question. This is not your fault, Perry. This is my fault. I'm, I'm the organizer. Uh, <laughs> so uh, one quick question. You used the term quasi-static a couple times, and this is something that we've thought about within the context of legged insect locomotion, and I know it's, it's an idea that's really growing, and I was really struck at how your, you said 27 centimeter monolith robot moved like it looked tiny, even though it's huge. Uh, can, you, can you speak to using macro scale robots as models of small animals as long as you get those dynamics right? Is that a promising direction, do you think? Yeah, so I, I, you know, I call it quasi-static for the caterpillar certainly because I, you know, it can stop at any point in a in a step, and it and it's not carrying any any kinetic energy over, so there's very little dynamics there. As we get to the bigger robots, I think that's a little less less true um, because they, you know, it doesn't scale really accurately in that way. Um, I, I don't think it's essential that our robots need to mimic those properties. I think if we can exploit dynamics a little bit more in our robots, because we know more about it, we can control it. Uh, I don't think the animals have a choice. I think that they, they're, you know, they're damping everything. Um, so I think it's something that we probably have to be aware of, but it's not a concern or a limitation in the design of the robot. Yeah, no, that makes a lot of sense. Yeah, you know, we're not limited in the same way. It's like, it's, you know, we're building a robot, any material, any design. Yeah. Yeah. Yep. No, that's fantastic. Well, thank you so much. Uh, thank you. Yeah. And uh, let's uh, invite our final speaker onto the stage for this session. Uh, so, Professor Nick Gravish. Uh, Nick Gravish is an assistant professor 
in the mechanical and aerospace engineering department at the University of California, San Diego, uh, where he's the PI of his robotics lab. Uh, there they study the movement dynamics uh, in biological and robotic systems. Uh, and uh, Nick is uh, driven by developing new methods for analysis and generation of locomotion tools from robotics, uh, computer vision, and physics. So today he's gonna tell us about uh, efficiency, agility trade-offs, and resonant spring wing flapping flight. So Nick, please take it away. Awesome, thank you so much for the invitation. Can I just get a thumbs up that y'all can hear me? From Barry, thank you, Barry. Um, so uh, I just want to um, uh, acknowledge this is a, a product of a long-standing collaboration with um, some folks at Georgia Tech, Simon Sponberg Lab, um, the Edgel Systems Lab, um, and in particular uh, James Lynch and Jeff Gower, the students who did all of this work. Um, and you know what I want to talk about is that uh, there is a, a huge history of insect flight research um, spanning uh, muscle physiology, fluid mechanics, neuroscience, um, flight control, and in in all of these areas there are um, uh, hundreds if not thousands of studies um, on these particular topics. Um, and what I want to talk about today is what I think is a, a notable gap um, in the insect flight uh, research uh, literature, as well as in the, the flapping wing robotics literature. And that's really on the mechanics of the thorax and the system dynamics of uh, flapping wings, actuators, and springy um, elements that are interacting with those systems. Um, and I think that in this uh, domain, there are sort of the numbers of tens of studies um, compared to the thousands uh, of, of sort of fluid mechanics studies in insect flight. Um, there's been beautiful work to elucidate um, morphological structures in the insect thorax um, that, uh, that transmit motion from muscle to wing. Um, there have been materials testing of isolated um, specimens from the insect thorax uh, to identify elastic structures and, and the history of sort of um, highly elastic um, resolent protein, for instance, uh, has been you know, first identified in the insect thorax. Um, so that we know that there are these uh, springy materials within the thorax. We know that there's these uh, wonderful structures that transmit motion through the um, complicated thoracic uh, uh, exoskeleton. Um, however, kind of connecting all these systems up uh, at, at a systems level, um, there's been less work uh, done uh, in this domain. And I want to make the claim that um, prior experimental evidence for resonance, this sort of um, phenomena of um, uh, optimizing the wing motion with a spring mass damper type system, um, the prior experimental evidence for this um, has been indirect um, and really relied on estimates of power measurements, um, despite years of, of claims that the insect flight system is a resonant system. Um, I want to claim that um, there haven't been any systematic measurements of thoracic stiffness um, of the intact thorax um, in relation to the system's natural frequency, system being uh, the, the insect flight system. Um, and lastly, I think that the uh, implications of resonance on control and stability uh, for flapping wing flight are relatively unexplored. Um, is, it, is it good to um, add in a highly resilient spring to your, uh, your flapping wing system? Uh, does that give you control benefits? Does that give you stability benefits or energetic benefits? Um, and I think that we're really trying to uh, you know, really at the tip of the iceberg in terms of exploring these questions. So in my talk today, I want to kind of introduce um, the way that we've been thinking about these questions. Um, and in particular, I want to do kind of three things. I want to introduce a um, dynamical framework that we can use to uh, quantify uh, resonance and quantify the, the spring wing system, as we call it. Um, I want to use this dynamical framework to then um, cut across all sorts of scales of uh, flapping wing insects and see uh, commonalities in their sort of resonant behaviors. Uh, and then I want to use it to uh, address some of these trade-offs that I've been talking about or that I alluded to earlier um, in control and stability. So first, let me introduce the spring wing system. Um, we uh, envision the spring wing system as comprising both a parallel elastic element as well as a series elastic element, um, actuators being the uh, indirect muscles, actuate the thorax, um, compressing it, um, compressing these uh, elastic elements, and then the elastic elements transmit motion to the wing, which uh, is uh, succumbed to aerodynamic and inertial forces. Um, we can quantify all of these. Um, uh, relatively simply, um, the inertial torque, and I'm, all of this is going to be sort of from the perspective of a wing hinge. So the inertial torque is just the inertia of the wing multiplied by its, its acceleration. Um, the elastic torque is just the uh, spring constant, the lump spring constant of the system multiplied by the wing angle. Um, and then there's an aerodynamic torque that's applied to the wing, uh, which can be computed using the sort of standard aerodynamic calculations. Um, but ultimately, we end up with an equation um, that looks very similar to a spring mass damper equation. Uh, we have an inertial, an elastic, and an aerodynamic term. And then we have the muscle torques that are applying the um, ultimate torque to the, the wing hinge. So the question I want to ask is, 
um, what is the stiffness model for an insect thorax? Um, so what does this K really look like? Um, and we want to do this experimentally. Um, and the second question is, is this assumption valid for real systems? It's the assumption that we can, um, we can simplify aerodynamic damping to uh, this relatively simple nonlinear equation right here. So the first thing that we did um, in about 2018, uh, student Jeff Gao started um, doing dissections of Manduca sexta thoraxes, um, placing them on a shaker where we could prescribe physiologically relevant vibrations or oscillations to the thorax um, while measuring the force. So effectively doing the same uh, work loop type measurements that uh, Barry was just talking about. Um, and you know, in, what's really important about this is the insertion point of this, uh, of this force sensor is at the insertion point of the muscle. So we're kind of looking from the muscle's perspective, what does it see uh, in terms of the material properties of the thorax. Um, the muscle sees a relatively elastic thorax. Okay, this is a force displacement plot. Um, there is some damping in the system, but notably, if you look across the frequency range here from 0.1 hertz to 90 hertz, um, Hawk Moth, I believe, is about 25 hertz in terms of wing beat uh, frequency. Um, across this range of frequency, the damping was relatively constant. Um, and this was kind of surprising. This implied that there was a, um, a damping in the system uh, the system was still relatively elastic, but that this damping um, had this particular character of what's called structural damping. Um, so it's a frequency independent damping within the thorax. Um, similar damping has been found in cockroach legs. Um, so that was kind of interesting. Um, but uh, we'll come back to this, this structural damping in a little bit, but just take note that um, this is the, sort of the first uh, measurements of the elastic characteristics of the intact thorax um, uh, in a flapping wing insect. Uh, it allows us to calculate uh, what the sort of K value of this, uh, of our spring wing equations are. The second question that we wanted to ask was, um, are the assumptions of uh, lumping all of your aerodynamic phenomena into this particular equation here valid? Um, and so to do this in my lab, we built a dynamically scaled system where we could vary the um, spring mass and aerodynamic properties of the system uh, while keeping the Reynolds number consistent with the Reynolds number for flapping wing insects. Um, we in particular built springy elements by casting silicone torsional springs. Um, a student of mine had just taken the soft robotics uh, course at, uh, at uh, UCSD and uh, got inspired by um, casting springs of, of various shapes and sizes so that we could very precisely control the elastic properties. We did a um, huge array of uh, amplitude frequency sweeps, effectively doing uh, sort of similar um, measurements that you would do with the material, looking at the, um, the, the uh, amplitude gain as you oscillate it at different frequencies. Um, and I, I refer you to this um, paper and in interface uh, last year for all the details. But in particular, what we found is that um, across all these experiments with different inertia, different uh, stiffness uh, springs, all of our predictions from the spring wing equation that I've shown you before matched with the experimental measurements um, and also matched with simulation uh, results as well. Um, so all this sort of uh, led us to conclude that this uh, very simple equation um, is a useful equation to predict the ultimate spring um, wing behavior of these kind of resonant uh, uh, spring, spring wing systems. Okay. Um, but we wanted to now uh, answer the question, um, can we kind of use this uh, equation to cut across uh, the wide array of uh, morphological differences and size differences in flapping wing insects as well as robots? And so we wanted to non-dimensionalize this equation. Um, and to do this, we made a, a simple assumption that the wing is moving as a sinusoidal uh, motion. Um, you can, uh, through um, uh, choosing appropriate non-dimensional variables, then turn this equation from this dimensional form to a non-dimensional form down here, where we have an inertial um, term, a non-dimensional spring uh, elastic term, and then we have our aerodynamic term, which looks a little bit different. And now I've put this particular um, coefficient here, one over n, uh, which is a dimensionless number that quantifies kind of the importance of, uh, of aerodynamic phenomena in this spring wing equation. Okay, so what is n? Um, we can measure the quality factor of the resonant oscillations. So this is just sort of how um, sharp your resonant peak is. Um, and just from an empirical standpoint, you can see that there's a nice linear relationship between uh, this coefficient n uh, and the quality factor of the spring wing system um, in experiment. Okay, this gives some suggestion that uh, this, this value n is somehow um, telling you kind of how resonant the system is. Um, we can go further though, and if you look at the actual form of n, um, uh, you can see that it's related to the, or it's exactly equal to the maximum inertial torque divided by the maximum aerodynamic torque of the spring wing system. 
Okay, um, and if you uh, if do this calculation, you find that the uh, the value of n is equal to the inertia of the wing divided by the aerodynamic coefficient multiplied by the amplitude. Okay, so um, this is exactly just the value of the peak inertial torque that the wing sees uh, divided by the peak aerodynamic torque that the wing sees. Um, if the aerodynamic torque is, is zero or is incredibly small, uh, n is very, very large. Um, and if aerodynamic uh, uh, torque is very small, then the damping in the system is very small. So this kind of gives you this, uh, this insight that n is related to maybe the um, quality factor of the resonance. Um, but we went a step further, we, you know, we were well aware of the literature and, and had um, uh, very much um, uh, recognized Weisbo's work, Torkel Weisbo's work on um, uh, resonant systems, uh, resonant flap and wing systems. Um, and uh, we found that this, this coefficient that pops out of this non-dimensional equation, um, N, is actually the number that Weisbo used to estimate uh, the um, efficiencies of flap and wing insects. Um, so in our, in our recent paper, we introduced this, this um, non-dimensional form of the spring wing equation. And, and in particular, uh, we introduce this coefficient n as the Weisbo number um, that uh, uh, calculates or, or that characterizes how uh, resonant flapping wings uh, systems are. So how does this vary with um, biological variability? Um, if we look across four orders of magnitude and mass, um, here I'm showing plots from beetles, flies, moths, uh, and this is the Weisbo number here. Um, these are log-log scales, but what you can see is that uh, the variation in n for the insect system is um, only over, over an order of magnitude. It's basically from two to eight uh, is, is uh, the variation across these flapping wing insects. Um, butterflies are down here, but they have a slightly different um, flapping uh, strategy than these other um, consistently hovering flapping wing insects. Um, you can add in robots, uh, the RoboBee, um, Delphi, um, some stationary robots, but you see that basically all these systems lie within this relatively restricted range of uh, Weisbo number uh, from about one to 10. Um, and the question that I wanna address now is why, right? Why should we see um, this relatively consistent range of, uh, of Weisbo number? Um, does that tell us anything about uh, these sort of uh, trade-offs in flapping wing systems? Um, and so uh, I wanna address this in three quick little vignettes um, uh, in terms of how the Weisbog number affects the efficiency, the uh, perturbation resistance, and the uh, control bandwidth of flapping wing uh, systems. So uh, remember N is this, um, this ratio of uh, inertial torque to aerodynamic torque. So high N is, is a sort of highly, um, potential, potentially highly efficient resonance system. Low N is a potentially um, low efficiency resonance system. But we can characterize this efficiency um, more quantitatively um, as a term called dynamic efficiency. It's the ratio of useful work, which is aerodynamic work, divided by everything else, okay, which is your aerodynamic inertial and your damping work. Um, so if this is one, it means that you are a perfectly resonant system. If it's lower than one, um, you're losing energy somewhere in your, um, your system. Um, Going back to our elastic model from our uh, Manduka measurements, uh, we knew that the, the damping was had this structural form. Um, and again, referring you to the details here, we can actually exactly calculate what the dynamic efficiency was and compare it to, uh, to um, empirically measured values as well as simulation. What you see is that as a function of this Weisbog number, um, when you have no damping in your body, you're just always at uh, a potential dynamic efficiency of one. Great, you know, you're sort of always um, using your energy most efficiently, putting it directly into aerodynamic work. As you start to have realistic damping in your body, your dynamic efficiency goes down and it goes down monotonically to eventually reach zero for really high um, values of N. And so this is our first uh, indication that this intermediate range of Weisbog numbers is potentially good because it, in any realistic material, there's body damping, there's some kind of dissipative um, uh, response of the material. And as that dissipative response um, is embedded in a system with higher and higher Weisbog number, the efficiency of that system goes down. Okay. So point being, and I show in this blue shaded regime here, um, the Weisbog numbers of flapping wing insects, this uh, shaded value right here is Manduka um, structural damping. And so in this regime here, you still have the potential for relatively high dynamic efficiency, um, despite having imperfect materials that make up your body. The next two uh, implications of this Weisbog number are on the transient dynamics of flight. So in particular, step responses, so the control bandwidth um, and perturbation resistance. 
In the first set of experiments we did, we measured the step response uh, of a spring wing system uh, experimentally. Um, and in the case of a low Weisbog number, you see a relatively long rise time. And in the case of a high Weisbog number, you see a relatively short rise time. Um, we can characterize this uh, in the following way. Um, this Weisbog number here shows the uh, effect with rise time. Um, and this shows that the step response time across N uh, varies linearly with the, the Weisbog number. And in particular, what we find is that high N causes a slow control response. So if you have a very um, springy system, if you think about a tuning fork, um, it takes a lot of time to pump up the, uh, the steady state oscillations into that system. However, if you have a relatively um, uh, the, over damped or, or uh, critically damped system, uh, you can reach your steady state amplitudes relatively quickly um, and actually very quickly within one, uh, one wing stroke um, in certain cases. Um, so this, this Weisbog number, when the Weisbog number is high, you have a slow control response of your system. In terms of perturbation resistance, we did experiments where we oscillated our uh, robophysical system, measured the output wing behavior, um, quantified this in phase space looking at the velocity versus position. And then we applied perturbations to the system through an aerodynamic perturbation, a jet of water. And we looked at how the wing motion was distorted by these aerodynamic perturbations. Um, we did this across these Weisbog number uh, range as well. And what we see is that as you vary this Weisbog number um, from one up to 10 um, in experiments, the wing stroke distortion, the sort of amount of effect of aerodynamic perturbations on the wing stroke, um, when you have this flow condition, um, is high at low Weisbog number, okay? This um, red curve shows the case of constant flow. The blue curve is just a control um, experiment with no flow at all. Uh, and what you can see is that, again, we see this effect of, of um, varying the resonant properties of your spring wing system. For um, low Weisbog number, you're very sensitive to aerodynamic perturbations. Um, and high Weisbog number, you're uh, robust to perturbations with almost no distortion of the wing stroke uh, under these kinds of aerodynamic perturbations. And so this kind of paints a, um, a complicated picture of, of building springs into these kind of flapping wing systems. Um, if you have a really um, high end system, uh, then you have potentially slow control responses, um, but you're very resistant to aerodynamic perturbations. Kind of makes sense because N is the inertial torque divided by the aerodynamic torque. And if the aerodynamic torque is, um, is unimportant, uh, that's the case of, of uh, being resistant to aerodynamic perturbations. So high end being um, uh, resistant to perturbations um, sort of makes sense from the, the equation for the Weisbog number. Um, so ultimately what we find um, in conclusion is that uh, we think that we have now a, a nice kind of um, non-dimensional framework that we can use to compare different systems um, that have springs, uh, aerodynamic flapping wings um, and actuators. Um, we think that this Weisbog number uh, N is a useful metric to characterize these systems. Um, and ultimately we think it paints a kind of complicated picture for um, what is a good design of a flapping wing system. Do you want to have extremely high N by maybe uh, making your wings be extremely inertial, uh, or do you want to have a relatively low end? Um, and with that, I refer you to um, our recent papers on this work, um, and I'm happy to take questions with what little time I might have. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Nick. This was uh, fantastic. Very clear, right to the point. Wonderful. Uh, and I think super relevant, not only to flapping wing flight, but I'm sure to lots of other areas of biomechanics. Uh, so it looks like uh, we have one raised hand. Uh, Dimitri, why don't you uh, ask your question? Oh, yeah, thank you. Yeah, hello, Nick. Yeah. Uh, I should have read your papers. I'm here. I can ask about this. And uh, it's inertia of aerodynamic, but inertia of what of your take? Uh, yes, so so the this number is effectively the inertia of the wing divided by the uh, aerodynamic coefficient of the wing and the amplitude. So the inertial torque, the maximum inertial torque of an oscillating just mass is uh, mass times um, the uh, the acceleration uh, of the system. And then the max aerodynamic torque is just the aerodynamic coefficient times the velocity squared. And so if you just, 
cancel out the, the terms from the top and bottom, you end up with the wing inertia uh, divided by the aerodynamic coefficient and the amplitude. But well, well, why, why do you take just the wing inertia if the whole body oscillates? This is what I don't understand. Oh, I see, I see. Um, you know, that's a great point. Um, what are the contributions of the uh, inertia of the moving muscle acting through the transmission? I, I think that that's, um, that's to be determined. Yeah, I, I think that that's a great point. And, and ultimately that would change, um, uh, change some of these inertia values. I would say that the transmission ratio of the, the muscle, the displacement of the muscle is quite small compared to the, the motion of the wing. Um, and so I think that the effect of the inertial, um, you know, inertial, mm -hmm. uh, acceleration of the muscle is going to be quite small compared to the, uh, the wing inertia. Uh, okay. Okay. I got it. Okay. Thank you. Wonderful. Uh, in the interest of everyone getting, uh, getting a break, I'm going to call it off here. Uh, but again, wonderful, wonderful talk, Nick. Thank you so much. And uh, I do want to remind everyone that we have this uh, discord server running. Uh, we've had a number of people asking questions. And uh, as Mike pointed out, I know it's a pain in the butt to have multiple things to juggle, but it's been really great uh, to help everyone connect. So uh, right now, it's uh, we have a scheduled break. Uh, we're going to reconvene in 50 minutes, five zero minutes. Uh, it's hard to tell you what time that will be because it will be different time for everybody. But hopefully, you have a time to eat breakfast, lunch, or dinner, and uh, we'll be back here. Uh, in the Eastern uh, time zone, that would be 11.45. In Central Europe, that would be 5.45 in the evening. Uh, so anyway, I hope everyone uh, has a good time. Quarter to the hour, that's what Mike says. And uh, we'll see you back soon. Uh, I'm also going to share a screenshot of how to use the Discord if uh, that's something you're interested in. So all right, great. Thanks, everybody. <laughs>
Yeah, so uh, for Monte, unfortunately that window does gray out a block that we can't see. Uh, if, if you're okay with it in the corner, that's fine. But, um, I see, okay. Uh, by the way, can you see the, the, the control bar down here? Yeah, I, I, I see that okay. too. Yeah. Um, I'm just wondering how can I, hmm, uh, I will see how to remove this. Hey guys, looking good. Okay. Oh, hide floating meeting controls. I didn't yes. know that was an option. Uh, control okay. shift all H. Okay, cool. Ah. Okay, I think you don't see anything. You see only my screen. <laughs> Yeah, so now there seems to be just one bar across the middle, which is strange. <laughs> really? Okay. <laughs> yeah. yeah I that as well, it's like a, a, a post box or something. Oh, it's gone now. Huh. How does it, how does it look like now? Now I can see the control bar, but I don't have the block in the middle, so I'm pleased. <laughs> <Yeah. Okay. laughs> Sorry. It's... <laughs> Probably we have to decide. Yeah, I prefer the control bar. Oh, perfect. No, okay. All right, just kidding. Okay. Let's keep the control yeah. bar now. That'll be less of an interference. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Oh, yeah, okay. <laughs> Great. Mike, do you want to kick us off? Is everyone back here? I thought you said fifth. Uh... Quarter till? Ah, yeah, yeah. it's quarter two, right? Yep. Okay, perfect. So welcome back to the second half of our workshop today. Yeah, thanks for sticking with us. I hope you've had enough sugar and caffeine to keep you going. So we're now moving. We, the first section was really looking at um, invertebrate robot morphologies. And now we're maybe thinking about invertebrate mines. And we're working from maybe lower level through to full swarm, swarm systems. And our, we're going to have three short talks. And then that's going to bring us nicely into a panel discussion at the end. So our first speaker uh, for this section is... Uh, Poramati Mananpong, who is currently a professor of biorobotics at the Maersk McKinney Muller Institute at the University of Southern Denmark. And his website states that his long-term goal is to understand how brain-like mechanisms, in, uh, including biomechanics, can be realized in artificial agents so that they can become more like living creatures on the level of performance. So I share a goal with uh, many people here. And in order to achieve that goal, he has developed neural mechanisms for locomotion generation and ad adaptation in like robots. Um, and hopefully we're going to hear some about uh, some of that today. So with that, I will hand over to Paramati. Yes, okay, so thanks uh, for a very nice introduction. So uh, yeah, today I would like just to try to present uh, what we have achieved, you know, over the kids on our research. Um, now, I, okay. So um, here I just want to, you know, like summarize or point out that actually not only us who are doing like biorobotics or, you know, like insects like robots, but in uh, basically there's so many people, including, you know, like many experts in, in this workshop, they have been you know, working on the long history of, you know, like bio, biology by engineering and also engineering inspired biology, where you can see different spectrum from, you know, like insects to worm and so on and so forth. And today I would like to focus on this kind of uh, uh, two things of animals. Uh, one is the kind of a cockroach locomotions. And also we want to show how we can scale up from a uh, complex locomotion of insects to uh, this kind of uh, locomotion plus object manipulation. It will turn out to become like the object transportations. And afterwards, we will also uh, I will also show a little bit about uh, complex navigations like the dung beetles. Uh, let's start to look at the locomotion control first. Okay, uh, when we look at the principle of animal locomotion, and I, I think everyone all agree that it is, is, we cannot see this as a single component, but basically this locomotion is kind of emerging behaviors that consists of, you know, like from biomechanics, from other previous talk has also point out on this. And also in terms of the local uh, control or in here, like locomotion control. And on top of this, you also, you have the uh, high level control, which I think you will see uh, after my talk from Baba uh, on these aspects here. 
And if you look into a bit of more detail here, okay, I just try to move this bar a little bit. If you look into the detail of each ingredients, uh, you can see that, for example, biomechanics is also consists of like the structures, muscles, or even different type of material properties that we have to consider on that. And in, uh, when you look at the locomotion control, you have to understand the principle of coordination from individual joint control to Joint joints control or the coordination between joints like interlimb coordination and also the coordination between legs or interlimb coordinations. And also on top of this, you will have like decision makings and learning and memory for the cognitive intelligence and so on and so forth. And here I will mainly focus on this aspect on the uh, middle part here on the locomotion control here. So we have looked at the, for example, insect, uh, we use insect as our biological model to uh, synthesize our locomotion control for robots. Here we can see that like cockroach or insects, many insects, they share uh, some kind of the common control principle where they have, as we all know, they have a kind of central pattern generators, which is the neuron circuits that can generate rhythmic patterns without sensory feedback. But however, the sensory feedback is also important for adaptability of the robot or the insects. So by taking these inspirations, we develop or we, we synthesize our neural control, which consists of, for example, 200 neurons here. And in this diagram, I want, just wanted to point out that the way we synthesize the controller is we use the kind of modular concept. So basically we try to create the neural network as the um, uh, building blocks, which consists of sub-circuits like central pattern generators, uh, central pattern, certain pattern generator, post-processing, and also premotor neural network, and so on and so forth. By having this sub-module, you can reconnect them and recombine them to generate different function, which I'm going to show you afterwards. So basically, when you combine different modules in this aspect, um, this module or this network will generate the basic locomotion. And on the right side here, you can add additional component for the uh, local leg control. This is for adaptability of the leg when you have a robot, for example, here. With that network, we can generate different gates of uh, robot to have insect-like uh, locomotions. And also you can have this kind of the clamping abilities by adding the local leg control that individual leg can adapt or can adjust by extending to search for ground contact point. And also we have the backbone joint control for clamping ability of robots. So uh, from these points, uh, one of the thing we had is that, uh, what about the adaptability when the robot walk on, you know, like unknown environment and there's the hole on the ground, for example, like in this case. So inspired by uh, insect uh, searching behaviors, uh, for example, this is the really impressive work or excellent work from uh, Brahms in, in Germany. Uh, they propose that uh, the fruit fly, they show this kind of chaotic searching behaviors. Inspired by these works, we also, we uh, implement uh, chaotic CPGs, which means that by using the center pattern generators, uh, we can switch the neuron parameters to generate the rhythmic uh, pattern for normal locomotion, or we can switch the neuron parameters to generate this kind of chaotic behaviors for self untrapping when the robot step in the hole. In this case, what you see here is that when the robot step uh, into the hole, we switch the uh, normal steady state uh, periodic oscillator to become chaotic uh, oscillators such that the leg of the robot these kind of random behaviors and by doing so it can just release the, the foot out of the hole and also we know that uh, this kind of chaotic behavior in fact is is, is exists in many type animal is also uh, one of the uh, papers from uh, Babala Webb, uh, she also, she, she, uh, she present that you can observe this kind of chaotic behavior in worm, for example. Uh, the next thing I want to, to, to talk is about our uh, projects uh, called the life projects. So previously, I briefly show you how we can synthesize the neural control for generating the basic locomotion of insect like robots. In these projects, we want to scale the behavior up to understand the 
complex uh, locomotion and also the complex object manipulations. In this project, we have uh, three main partners from Germany and also from Sweden, uh, where they do the behavioral experiments and also biomechanical investigation. And from our side, we do biorobotics model. Here. So what we try to look here is that basically we try to understand what are the key principles or the key uh, features or the key ingredients that this little animal, the dung beetle, uh, uh, it used or it exploit to achieve this kind of uh, complex uh, locomotion and object manipulations to transport the dung ball, for example. To do that, we also we, uh, we we first we try to use our existing hexapod robot with the normal uh, standard uh, structures and try to have our hexapod robot to push or roll the ball. But it turned out it was so difficult because the body or the leg orientation was not uh, suitable for that. It always become unstable uh, behaviors. And in this case, we look into the uh, micro CT scan of the dung beetle here, and we precisely look at the leg orientation of the dung beetle, and we try to imitate this uh, leg orientation into the dung beetle-like robots. As you can see here is that by having this cup leg orientation in this aspect here, um, you, the, the robot basically create more contact points uh, between the legs or between the limbs of itself to the object uh, structures. With this uh, orientation, it makes the robot become more stable to be ready for rolling the ball. So in this case, what we learn here is that in, in, in fact, if you want to create the complex behavior, it's not just about the single point contact, like what we traditional do as a foot contact point here, basically the system needs to exploit the whole body or the, whole, the multiple contact points with the substrate such that you can generate more stable uh, behaviors. And uh, from that uh, aspect now, we also, we basically we apply the basic neural control that we, that I shown before to uh, implement this control on this uh, dung beetle-like robot. In this case, basically we generate a, a basic uh, tripod gate, which, which has been observed in the dung beetle. The next question we are asking here is that how do the dung beetles transport their dung ball? This turn into like two complex behavior that need to be considered. One is kind of object manipulation, where uh, if you look here, the dung beetle basically, uh, it used the, the high legs and the middle legs to roll the ball while the front legs here uh, try to walk backwards. So basically on one hand, we can see this as the object manipulation and locomotion, or on the other hand, you can see that the animal try to walk on the different substrates. One is like on the ground and the other substrate is like a roaring substrate on the ball. So what we did here is that we perform the visual investigation and also we do the statistical analysis here. Um, this is the work of my PhD student, uh, Bing Guang from uh, Wistex. Uh, he, he, he did a very interesting work where he tried to analyze the uh, similarity of the leg when the legs swing together, when the legs move together, and then we look at this similarity between legs, and then we can extract uh, four rules based on that. And what we learned here is that um, we can we, we see that uh, while rolling the ball, the dung beetle, they, uh, it doesn't want to move to front leg at the same time. Otherwise, it will become unstable. That's the first rule. The second rule is that uh, the uh, middle legs and the high leg on the opposite sides, they tend to move uh, at the same time, this form a kind of the trot gait uh, for the middle and the high legs. And also uh, the third rules, we found that on the same side, they, they, they try to not to move at the same time, otherwise it will, it will become un unstable. And then the last one is that we observed that the middle legs, they try to also perform alternating. So, so they don't want to move uh, or lift or place on the ball at the same time or on the surface at the same time. So from these four rules here, we try to synthesize our neural control uh, based on that four rules uh, in, in parts. So we first, we perform the uh, simulation here and 
what you see here is that this is the, the first neural control that we develop as the module for generating the basic locomotion of the hexapod robots. Taking these locomotion control frameworks, we uh, reconfigure or we take some module of this. As you see, this like the, the, the red box is a center pattern generator here and some pre-modern neuron uh, network that we reuse them in the different aspect here. And when we recombine them in this aspect, uh, we could uh, generate this kind of the uh, dung beetle like uh, ball roaring behavior here. Basically the trick what we did here is that we move the middle leg and the high leg uh, forwards and the front leg, we move it backwards. So in this combination of forward and backward locomotion, it turned out to become like uh, ball rolling behaviors like the down beetle here, but however, this is uh, is still uh, a long term to go because what we can achieve first here is in, in the simulation, and the second thing is that the speed that we can achieve is still far from the real down beetle because it's still uh, excluding the dynamic uh, motion and so on and so forth. However, we have translated these uh, implementations into the real robot, and unfortunately. Uh, um, I could not show that uh, result here due to that uh, still in the uh, uh, revisions or we have submitted that papers. Um, the next issue I want to discuss with you here is that in terms of the navigations here, if you look at this video, we can see that this animal, uh, when it try to perform like uh, searching for food or uh, moving uh, back to the nets, Interestingly, when it moves out of the nets, it walk like uh, with its, its head walking uh, outwards uh, to, the, to the food source. And when it try to move back home, it still use the same heading direction. It doesn't change the heading directions. Here it moves out and then it collect the ball and then it still walk backwards home here. And uh, in this case, this, uh, this beetle is basically, it grabs the ball and then just try to, to, to use this pellet uh, uh, as the other support to move uh, for navigations. So here, the question we have here is that how to realize these uh, robust and long distance navigation. And we have learned uh, from our colleague that uh, this animal, it, it, it doesn't use landmark. So basically just use this kind of path integration as other insects does. To do this, uh, what we did here is that we developed the, uh, the higher level neural control, or in this case, a neural navigation control. And this is the work of my, my colleague, uh, Dr. Uh, Xiao Feng, uh, also from uh, University of Southern Denmark here. So in this case, we still use a modular-like concept where you can see that we have the first module, which is the path integrations. And the second module is, in this case, is, is this is the card, the navigation planners, which consists of three subcomponents. And also we have the other network to have it more robust uh, against the noise and perturbations. So in these three sub modules here, what it does is that each of them, basically we have the uh, navigation planner to generate the co-directed navigations. In this case, we have the visual uh, information that if the robot uh, miss the home, it can use the visual information, try to search for, for the home. And also we have this kind of engines where we use the kind of the noise for explorations to search for the feeders. And the last one is basically we convert the actual position into the expected heading back home positions. In this case, to let the animal or the robot in this case to move backwards home here. So by having these combinations here, we can uh, uh, perform the real robot experiments. In this case, we have a robot uh, walking outdoor without the GPS here. And uh, okay, so here you can see, in this case, we pre pan the path that the robot basically know where the goal is. And in this case, one is leashed to the goal, um, it's performed this car kind of backwards uh, walking to uh, leach to its home or its uh, the nets here. And this is the kind of the tracking uh, of the actual behaviors here. So, so uh, here I would like to uh, 
give you a bit of summaries now. Uh, so what I have shown you today here, basically we try to scale up from the locomotion to object manipulation and also to the navigation behavior by using the synthesized um, approach of the neural control here. And here, basically what we learned here is that uh, modularity is also a good aspect uh, to understand the neural mechanisms where we can reconfigure the, ne the, the network to generate or reuse them for other uh, behaviors. Also hierarchical uh, architecture is also important where we can you know, like, uh, make it as layers and also the whole body and the multi-contact point is also not important for stability and also for object manipulations. The last thing we have learned is also, you know, like right now is, is, is a good uh, combination where we have to work together between engineer and uh, biologists that uh, we can bring, uh, you know, like from different angles and try to uh, learn from each other and using robot to uh, answer uh, some hypothesis from biological study and also using biological inspiration to create the new robot technologies. So I think uh, I want to skip this. And here, this is the kind of almost the last slide. I just want to elaborate a, a little bit here is that uh, based, based on this kind of synthesis approach and modularity, we also, we work on the other project on the uh, vertebrate or the gecko like robot projects together with our uh, Chinese uh, colleague in Nanjing here. Basically we reused our neural network here and then try to translate this neural network for this type of gecko like robot here for, for clumping uh, up, up a steep slope here, for example. And with this, I want to uh, leave you with the future uh, directions, which what we address here is still uh, far from majors, where we you will see from the foreign talk, I believe, from you know like cognitive intelligence into what the higher level and central complex, and also from Sabina on the uh, swarm intelligence where. We have to think about not only the individual leg or joint coordination, but, but it should be also between the body and body coordination to have more swarm like intelligence behaviors. So, with this, I would like to thank for your attention and also my collaborators and also our research funding. Thank you. So thank you very much for a fantastic talk. And we're we're still running pretty much on time. So we've maybe got time for a question if anyone wants to raise their hand or hit the hand button um, or ask anything in the in the chat. So maybe I can step in and ask a quick one then. Um, what I was really struck by was this idea that the, the dung beetle will move forwards when it's walking, but will move backwards when it's rolling the ball. And so it's essentially changing its morphology to solve a specific task. And this rang bells to me about what Dario was talking about earlier. Like, would you see this as a design principle we should be thinking about for robotics, or is this maybe evolution stuck in a local minima? Um, actually, I, I see this as uh, we should consider this for robotics development, where we should think about exploiting the biomechanics, for example, as much as we can. So animal basically they, they exploit the, the skin also as a part for, you know, like efficient locomotions, use their legs as the manipulator or as an arms. And I think that that could be um, benefit. And also we can save a lot of energy. For example, we already have six legs. Why don't we just use, you know, like for other thing else? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it seems fantastic way to maybe you have robots and uh, that can adapt on the fly as well. They can yeah. use them in different places. Yes. Okay, so maybe we can pick this up later. Um, especially, I have a, a I have a question. Uh, yeah, Joe. Uh, how do you compute the waveform trajectories of the neurons? Do you use a conductance based model or a nonlinear dynamical model? So in this case, we use the uh, a simple nonlinear dynamical model where we use uh, two neurons, and each neuron we have the uh, nonlinear transfer functions, and by having the uh, recurrent connections between two neurons. In this case, we can generate these type of waveform or central pattern generators. Okay. Great, thanks very much. So maybe we can, if there's any more chat, we can check that up on the Discord channel uh, later, but maybe we can. So thank you very much, Paramati, for a great talk. And maybe Barbara, you could switch to start sharing your screen. Okay.
Yeah, and uh, just to give Barbara an introduction, I'm sure many of you have already met her at these uh, workshops or conferences before, but just for anyone who's not aware of Barbara, she's a professor of biorobotics at the University of Edinburgh, where she leads the Insight Robotics Group. And um, she states that her research and main research interest is in the perceptual systems for the control of behavior through building computational and physical robot models of the hypothesized mechanisms. In particular, she focuses on insect behaviors as their smaller nervous systems may be easier to understand. And recent works include um, study of some of the more complex capabilities of insects, including multimodal integration in crickets and flies, navigation in ants, and learning in flies and maggots. Um, and also just congratulations, I believe. Someone's changed my thing here. So it might have been an EPSRC. I thought it was an ERC grant and also for getting me through my PhD. So over to you. Okay, thanks everyone. Um, so I was asked to to speak sort of a, about higher level cognition. Um, there's a whole debate we could have about what counts as higher level cognition. But the way I'm going to at least kind of focus really is about what I think has happened in the last 10 years that has really made a difference to the kind of models that I've built when I've been trying to use insects as inspiration for robots and indeed robots as models of insects. Um, so I'm just going to focus on, on three kinds of insights um, that have come from three specific collaborators here, but um, obviously there are a lot of other people out there who are working on these things as well and contributing information. So the first um, is that the ability to understand exactly what the behavior of these animals are has, has really been radically changed over the recent years. It, um, by greatly improved methods for tracking and analysis of behavior. So just as an example here, this is work from um, Benjamin Risser, where he's been able to track um, an ant crawling through, fo we're following the ant with um, a camera and we can actually track it in these very natural conditions and not just do that, but reconstruct um, afterwards the whole ground surface and project the track that's being extracted onto that ground surface. So we can get really detailed information about what the ant is experiencing in its normal foraging behavior. And then a second example um, is uh, thinking about the um, anatomical information that's coming. Um, and this has been really astonishing over the last few years, how much we've learned about the anatomical connections in the insect brain um down to the level you know not just of individual neurons and their their overlap and their connectivity but even connectomes that actually tell us about the precise synaptic connectivity between neurons in the brain um at a at a degree at a scale you know the number of neurons that we know about and the the scale of the detail is just completely overwhelming compared to when i started out in this field and then finally, um, I also want to mention, of course, that this has also come along with a lot of ability to both image and control these neurons, um, mostly in fruit flies, um, but increasingly in other animals. Um, and so this is just to mention another collaborator of ours is Leanne McCurdy, who's, for example, um, uses fruit flies and is able to do calcium imaging of individual neurons in its memory circuits during while the animal is doing a learning task in this case an odor shock pairing task we can actually for individual neurons see how their activity changes during the the process of learning so this i think is incredibly exciting and i'm just going to talk about two examples quite briefly that kind of illustrate how we've been trying to use some of this information in what we work on um, so the first example, um, I think a number of you will have seen already, and I'm not going to go into the details of it, but just try and give you the flavor, um, is that we have built a model of the central complex circuit in the insect brain and how it might support path integration. And this was quite uh, exciting work to be involved with. It involves Stanley Heinzer and, of course, and Tom Stone was the PhD student who did this work, where we actually could based on Stanley's wonderful information, we could build a pretty much one to one model of the neuro and neuroanatomy in the central complex that we thought was critical to this path integration function. And then we could actually demonstrate that it indeed um, could 
perform this function to integrate optic flow and skylight compass information to track the location and return home. And not only could we show that it worked, but we could also gain a lot of insight into the structure function relationships. So for example, that the, the vector that the animal is moving on, it seems to be expressed as a sinusoidal activation function across a set of neurons. So I'm just going to show uh, the little kind of video and again, this is just to give you the flavor. So this was the kind of anatomy that we had. Um, and what's shown in this kind of circular thing is how we've interpreted that anatomy. So there's a kind of inner ring of um, a compass neuron, which basically is lighting up as the insect is going in different directions. The middle ring is accumulating the distance that's being traveled in each direction. And then the outer ring is performing the steering and that steering works because there's this shift, this offset between uh, the, the input that the outer ring gets from the compass and from the middle ring, which is the memory. So as I said, I'm not, it would take, you know, a long time to explain the whole thing, but the, the key, I'll just run it again, just to sort of make the, the key point. The key point is, even though this looks like a, you know, a nice artificial, um, construction. In fact, every connection that we're showing here, we could actually justify from anatomical basis uh, that Stanley gave us. So the, the, it really is a one-to-one -one model, but we could use it in the agent, um, not only to do kind of out, outbound exploration and then find its way directly back to its nest, but it also has this kind of emergent property that um, when it overshoots its nest, it will start to do a spontaneous search behavior without any additional information or any additional controller needed. So more recently, um, some of you might have seen uh, last year's Living Machines that my student Jan Stenkiewicz, um put has taken this central complex model and put it on a drone to test it in the field. Um, it has a stabilized camera and we use that camera to calculate optic flow and we have these two matched filters, um, which are measuring the optic flow at, at, at orthogonal directions, which means that combined as inputs to the, to the integrators, we actually get the real ground vector, the ground velocity um, being summed up in this system. And again, to cut a long story short, um, this indeed is able to be used in the field so we can send the drone out on a long path um, of hundreds of meters. Um, and then using exactly the neural circuit that I just told you about, it's able to find its way back to within a few meters of its original location. Okay, and then just to kind of tell you where we're going with this a little bit is um, we're really enjoying the fact that more and more detail is coming out about these connectomics in this central complex. So this is very recent work. It's currently under revision um, at, at PLOS Comp Biol, and it's being done by my postdoc, Roman Goulard, um, where, where there's some newly identified connections within the central complex that seem to be quite crucial for the output side. So these neurons, which I've called are called PFL neurons, um, receive input from this kind of compass, central compass, which has a bump of activity in a particular place. And they seem to connect to the output system that's causing the steering. And what's interesting here is that we can actually, people have actually mapped every synapse between these neurons. And this is what's sort of shown here is that, that we can say how many synapses are there between any pair of these neurons and as you'll see here it's not it's not here perfectly um a perfect line as you might think here but there's actually some change so there's actually more connections in some parts than others and stronger connections in some parts than others and this is actually summarized in a kind of more intuitive way here so we've just kind of mapped the eight connections now so the connections from these eight EPFLs to the left side are shown in red, uh, I think the left side is shown in red and to the right side, no, yeah, to the right side is, is shown in red and to the left side is shown in green. And what you can see is that essentially what this means is we have this kind of crossing point 
And that turns out to work very nicely as a way to kind of steer the system. So essentially, um, the, the motor output to the left and to the right will be stronger if the bump is to one side, then it'll be stronger on the right. If the bump is to the other side, it will be stronger on the left. And that means you can turn and steer towards a cue. So we've gone from the detailed synaptic connections to extract a control system that actually lets you do very effective steering. Okay, so that was the first example. And then um, to talk a, a little bit about a second example, um, we've also looked at another area of the insect brain called the mushroom bodies. And again, this model came out um, a little bit before there's been this explosion of data, but you know, exploited what data we had at the time. Um, so this is now, maybe it may be easiest if I sort of show you the video, which is the motivation as well. So the idea is we have a, an ant that's this time using visual memory to try and follow a path where you're sort of seeing at the bottom a low resolution image of what, what the agent can see as it moves through this environment. And what it wants to do is to remember those images and use them to guide its memory. And so again, just kind of giving you the overview and you can go and look at the details if you're not familiar with it. Um, the basic idea is um, the mushroom body had been known to be learn learning olfactory patterns and it does this here by if you have an odor, um, projection neurons that receive that odor project into this big set of Kenyan cells which gives you a sparse encoding and the main learning mechanism that you can do is to um, change the strength of these Kenyan cells to output neurons according to whether you receive reward or not. So we simply took the same architecture and applied it to the visual problem. So we have panoramic views that come in, they cause a particular pattern. And here it was literally just the kind of um, intensity pattern that we used. We project that in a random fashion to this higher number of Kenyan cells, which gives us um, a sparse representation of each visual pattern that we want to remember. And then we learn those visual patterns, either as patterns that we see on the on the inward route going home or patterns we see on the outward route. Um, and so then depending on our current motivation, um, we can learn the things that we see as we go in one direction or the other, and then we can use that information, the memory of what we saw as a way to navigate, basically by trying to always move in the direction that looks most familiar. So that was the kind of overall um, structure here. Um, and again, we, you know, in building this model, we gained insight into the kind of structure function relationships. So um, the fact that the, the usefulness of sparse coding, um, and in the way that the, the motivation and the reward are kind of paired so that you have, you learn particular types of things in particular motivational states, which I'll come back to in a moment. So, and again, um, we've, we've tested this on robots and I'm actually gonna, again, refer to um, some work that was presented at Living Machines last year by my student, Li Zhu. Um, and this actually, advanced a little bit on the circuit that I just told you about, um, exploiting some of this connectomic status. So here, what he looked at was what's being revealed recently about these Kenyan cells, which is if you actually look at the detailed structure of the axons of these Kenyan cells, it turns out they, they connect to each other. They have these synaptic connections along the length of the axon. So he, uh, exploited that property as a way to have the Kenyan cells actually um, learn the sequence of information that was coming in. And he put this on a robot um, here shown in an outdoor uh, setting, and it has a event based camera, a DVS camera. So it's the camera gets as input anything that's changing in the visual information. And so what we're trying to learn is the sequence of changes that occurs as you follow along a route. Um, and so this was not in last year's <laughs> Living Machines. Um, since, since then, he's actually tested this robot in several different outdoor scenarios um, with different heights of vegetation and shown that indeed, if you look at the, um, 
the familiarity, which is here, the familiarity is shown by a, a decrease in the responding of the mushroom body output neurons um, for, for a segment of the route that you've learned versus a segment that you haven't learned. So you, the segment that you've learned is shown in red, the other the segment you haven't learned is shown in blue, and you can see very clearly um, that it's able to distinguish the views that it's seen before from the views it hasn't seen before. Okay, and then um, to say where we're going with, with this, um, we're now exploring in much more detail some of these mushroom body connections. Um, and this is current work of my student, Evropetus. Um, so here we're looking at this kind of output part, which before I just kind of showed you two, two outputs, which you, know, you could think of as shock versus sugar. So you learn patterns representing good things and you learn patterns representing bad things separately. And it turns out that the mushroom body is actually organized very much in this way, but with not just two compartments, not just two inputs and outputs, but with a set of 15 different inputs and outputs um, with specific reward neurons and specific output neurons coming together in this paired way. And moreover, there's been shown to be a number of interesting connections going from the output neurons back to the reward neurons, to the reinforcement neurons. So again, I'm not going to try and explain this whole circuit, but, but basically um, we took six of these mapped connections, six of the output um, mushroom body output neurons and six of the reinforcement neurons. And we looked at the ways that they're connected. So some of them excite each other, some of them um, inhibit each other. In each case, the uh, dopaminergic um, reinforcement neuron is modulating the weights of a particular mushroom body output neuron. And in the end, uh, we came up with this circuit where, again, e every single one of these neurons is actually mapped to a specific identified neuron in the mushroom body of Drosophila. And we could show that this whole circuit could actually produce um, not just replicate odor memory, but could actually replicate forgetting uh, characteristics and also has both short term and long term memory features. So again, uh, this, this work is currently under, under review at eLife and hopefully I think you can find the bioarchive uh, paper now if you don't want to wait. Okay, so I'm going to actually finish there and jump to my conclusion. Um, so what's really changed, I think, in the last 10 years um, for insect robotics is that we can now translate complex and realistic models of insect brain circuits to robotics um, for relatively complex behaviors such as navigation and visual memory. Um, and I think of particular interest are these circuits that actually seem to support quite general purpose capabilities. And what, why I say they're general purpose is that we actually find these same circuits across insect species that have incredibly divergent body plans, environments, lifestyles, and so forth. Um, and the two example circuits that I've mentioned, that I've described here are the central complex, which seems to be involved in directed behavior for all, all types of arthropods, um, the mushroom body, which seems to be involved in pattern recognition for pretty much all types of insects, which suggests these circuits are solutions that might have wide applicability for, for robotics. And then secondly, I think to, to really, you know, um, rev up our, our influence and our impact here, um, we, we need to start to appreciate more about the actual behaviors as well. So really to understand the true capacities of the invertebrates that we're trying to model by, for example, measuring their adaptive behavior and also testing our models in complex real world scenarios. And as was already hinted at in the previous talk, I think an interesting direction to go and the direction that I've just got uh, uh, this fellowship funding to do um, is actually to look at insect manipulation. And with that, I'll mention that we are, I am currently recruiting. So I'll finish there and hopefully that's some time for questions. 
Brilliant, thank you very much. So yes, we've got a question from Tony. So if you just want to unmute yourself and fire away. Uh, yeah, uh, hello, Barbara. Uh, nice to see you. Can you hear me? I can, yep. Great. Um, so uh, really interesting uh, talk. So um, I'm thinking about uh, the high cognition in insects um, uh, made me think when we were talking about these, uh, this data on the detailed synaptic connectivity of uh, these neurons, uh, I was wondering uh, how consistent is that across different animals? Um, and um, do we know much about the developmental process here? Because in um, vertebrates, uh, a lot of synapses uh, are the result of uh, a pruning process. So you go grow many more than you need, and then you prune back the ones you don't want. And a lot of that pruning is experience dependent. And you talked about in the learning algorithms and reinforcement. So I'm wondering if that could have an impact on the synaptic connectivity. Um, and finally, in, in the plot you showed uh, of this synaptic connectivity, there looked to be some uh, left-right asymmetry. And I was wondering if that could be a consequence of experience dependence, or could it be evidence of some side, or some kind of uh, sort of handedness, sort of lateral bias in the in the animal. Okay, that's a lot of questions. <laughs> I'll try and I'll try and answer briefly, but um, yeah. So, in terms of you know how how consistent the the connectivity is across species, it it does depend from area to area. Um, but for example, Stanley has been doing very thorough work on looking at the central complex in lots of different species, in locusts, in bees, in flies, and so on. And we do find differences, but there's a lot more similarities than differences. So the differences tend to be quite small. Um, so if you compare individuals, so how much consistency is there? And, and across individuals, there's huge consistency. So, so okay. really, really massive consistency, yeah. So, and it is perhaps one of this, you know, advantages of insects that we have this consistency. So we, we actually can, you know, be fairly sure about this. This is not to say there aren't developmental effects and, and experience dependent effects. Um, there are, and for example, the, the connectivity, the, the projection neuron to Kenyan cell connectivity, which people have previously described as random because it, they can't find it, any consistency, but actually that looks like it might indeed be experience dependent and people are looking into that now about whether that changes with experience um, so i'm not sure does that is that sufficiently answer your question is there evidence of pruning or is that not um, so much yes, yes there's evidence of pruning for example in in that system mm -hmm. great thanks so holger waving his hand I'm not sure oh i see it. right well let him sneak in okay so that wasn't a very successful uh, strategy so far in this workshop, which I really enjoyed. Absolutely fantastic, Barbara. That was amazing, and I think and it's it's the um, it's a really good example that over the last ten years, due to some progress in methodology in in, in insect um, um, uh, research, we can benefit way more than we could 10 years ago, really. I mean, this is uh, uh, pretty amazing. So the, um, um, I think it's, it's really interesting to look into this developmental point and actually to uh, recognize that um, the, the structure in the brain or in the nervous system of insects is more economic if, if you want to. And there is probably a, an explanation for that. And that has to do with a slightly more limited behavioral repertoire that insects need, need to serve. I'm not saying that, that they are dumb. I'm just saying that they have to cope with only um, a, a certain or a finite number of different behaviors that they need to control. But um, so I think the, the, the only thing, and I'm, I'm, I wonder when, when you will be uh, taking that one on. So if you want to integrate the control circuits, um, are you, and, and you know all this, the ideas about forward modeling and so forth, or forward control. Is that one of the next steps so that you can combine navigation with um, a basic balance control in a, in a highly dynamic system as well? Is that something that would interest you? I'm, I'm interested in everything, really. But um, <laughs> yeah, yeah, I think, I think 
it's true, you know, the focus recently, we haven't worried so much about, you know, what happens in the sort of dynamic or control part of it. So, so our drone, for example, is not being controlled by a, an insect inspired control system. And I think that's a really interesting point that we need to sort of bring that, that what people call low level control, or at least immediate behavioral, you know, uh, motor control part together with these higher level things. And we haven't done that so far, but I think it's a good point. Yeah. Great. I think we can wrap that up there and then maybe let Sabine come in. So thanks. For, thanks again, Barbara. And hopefully we see you in the panel discussion. Sure. So Sabine, I think if you can share your screen. Right. And perfect. And yeah. Ah, perfect. You're there. So yes. So our last speaker today uh, to wrap up before our panel discussion is, is Sabine Ert, who is an associate professor um, of swarm engineering at the University of Bristol in the UK. And Sabine lists her research interest as focused on investigating swarms across scales. And this really is scales. She goes all the way from nano robots for cancer treatment to larger robots and logistics, such as um, deploying drones and, and such like. So this really fits nicely with um, sort of stacking up the, the level at which the control that we're talking about. So. Without further ado, I'll hand across. Thanks very much. Uh, and I, I will try to cover some of the swarms that we're working on across scales, but also try to think about how these ideas that are, are very bio-inspired initially could be brought uh, out of the lab to people. So it, as you've many of you have seen, uh, the inspiration for swarms is very often these flocks of birds and their ability to do these beautiful complex dances in the sky and the features really that they have that they could be useful for real world applications. Uh, for example, the, the ability to add birds to that flock and that flock can continue to operate, which means that it can scale in number. Um, you know, if one bird falls to the ground, the whole flock doesn't crash. So it's robust to individual failure and together they can potentially do more than the sum of their parts. Huh? Now, what's fascinating is that these dances, they result from every one of those birds following a set of rules based on their local environment. Uh, and you see examples of, of swarming or self-organization everywhere around you in nature, whether it's ants as they create trails to your picnic table or bees as they make decisions about their next nest site or our ability to grow fully functioning human beings from just uh, a couple cells. So the challenge very often in our research is that we have a swarm behavior we'd like to achieve like collective motion, trail formation, decision-making or consensus, morphogenesis, the ability to grow shapes, uh, and others, but we need to crack the design question of how you make those individuals react to their local environment so that you get these desired swarm behaviors. And very often, we take two different approaches to that. One approach might be to use bioinspiration, uh, working with biologists who have studied some of these systems and, and adapting those rules for artificial systems. So here's work uh, from Dario Floriano's lab uh, back in 2011 when I was over there using flocking rules. So every robot is attracted to its neighbors, repulsed and aligns with its neighbors. And that gives rise to these dances in the sky as shown in these GPS trajectories. You might take inspiration from the ability of ants to create trails, to have these little kilobots, coin-sized robots, create trails here in the lab. So they move randomly in this case. And when they find that object in the upper right, they have trails that grow back uh, from that object. You might do consensus formation, and here you're seeing 400 kilobots exchanging information locally, trying to decide between blue or red. Here you see them initialized at blue or red, and over time, they converge to blue using an algorithm that's inspired uh, from honeybee decision making. And you also see uh, examples of, of morphogenesis. So here what we're doing is we have a swarm of 350 of those coin-sized robots. And these robots are exchanging virtual morphogens. So they have little chemical counters on board each robot. They only have two morphogens. And these morphogens um, follow rules that were described by Alan Turing. And these rules basically, uh, through the diffusion of those chemicals using chem communication across the robot swarm, you end up with spots. So let me show this again here. Here you end up <clears throat> with spots that emerge at the level of the swarm. And these spots then grow. Here you see those spots. They drive the growth of these little limb-like structures. And really what's interesting here is these shapes are entirely self-organized, but you quite consistently get these protrusions 
that emerge and you can chop those limbs off and they regrow or they reorganize and you could split that that uh, robot organism and it would self heal. So you get a lot of features for free using this, this bio inspiration that is typically quite interesting uh, if, if we manage to translate this out of the lamb. Now, th there are situations where we don't have the inspiration, and as a result of that, we need to learn or come up with, with the rules. And so here, what you're seeing is a swarm <coughs> of x pucks designed uh, with Simon Jones, and Alan Winfield, and Matthew Studley. And these robots have GPUs on board, and that allows them to run uh, artificial evolution. And as a result of that, these robots in 15 minutes go from not knowing how to push the Frisbee to one side of the environment to being able to push that Frisbee. And it's a combination of running loads of simulation on board and evolving their own behavior, sharing that behavior with neighboring robots, and then ultimately being able to find a controller that's useful. And something that we've paid attention to recently is to think about how we use machine learning in these contexts so that we can understand what it is the swarm is doing. And so for that, what we've been evolving is a structure called the behavior tree. And these are, are taken from the, the computer game industry. And the reason they're interesting is we can read the tree and essentially read what behavior the robot is doing at what point in time based on what trigger. You can color code it. And so if it's, it's a good way to start understanding what the rules were for that robot, but then that doesn't give you why the emergent behavior operated. And so you need new tools uh, using these behavior trees to understand that uh, emergence a little bit further. So I, I feel like we have a number of tools now to, to design robots, to make algorithms for robots, whether it's bioinspiration or using, using machine learning or things like artificial evolution. And so we've been excited in the past couple of years about thinking, of, thinking about where, where swarms would be used um, in a human context. And so we designed a, a, an escape room before COVID when we could actually lock people up in a room. And it took people around 40 minutes to escape. Uh, surprisingly more if you were a PhD student, I think you, you tended to overthink the escape room. But in that process, they learned a lot about swarming and how it might be useful or not useful. And then we would ask the public what they thought swarms could be useful versus the risks for society. Um, and lots of ideas that came through there, whether it's you know cleaning the ocean of plastic or surgery, medical robots, construction, um, inspection, surveillance, some that are less value on, on the left of that graph, some that were unusual, like massages, which I never um, thought of. And then what we did is we went and we drilled in with specific potential users of the technology to understand what they thought about it. So we spoke to users in, in infrastructure monitoring, like bridges. We spoke to users uh, who, who were firefighters to see if swarms would be useful. And we spoke to users in the, in the logistics area, warehouses, essentially, to understand if swarms would be useful for there. And, and I think what was interesting is, while those videos that you saw before, you know, they would seem quite science fiction to them, I think the, the conversation when we were really with these users and we said, OK, what are the tasks that you do on a daily basis? How do these tasks uh, work for you? Are there, are there areas of unmet need? Here's a swarm. And then we would give them an example of what a swarm would look like within their specific use case scenarios. And then we would say, well, would you use it? What would be the challenges, et cetera? And I think what I was excited about is, first of all, we didn't get the ooh, a swarm reaction. They seemed genuinely interested in the technology if it could solve very specific tasks that they had. Uh, but there was always a but, but the system needed to be trustworthy, but we needed to understand how this system uh, would operate to build confidence in what it would do. So I would say uh, opportunity if, if done well. And in particular, one area in which we've started to, to dive into is this, this idea of robots to organize space. Um, and, and the reason I'm bringing this up, even though it seems more applied that, than maybe some of the things we heard, is that the algorithms we're using are random walkers, very simple local interactions, and actually very insect inspired in how, in how we're pushing this to the real world. So, you know, very often when you think of swarms of robots, people think of Amazon or they think of Ocado. And in those very large companies, you have infrastructure, right? They put loads of R&D into the design of those systems. Um, the environment is a clean environment that was built for the robots. And, and so that works. That's not what we're talking about. I think the unmet need is 
small retail. We spoke to people who manage food banks. We spoke to people who, you know, would have pop-up warehouses or, or emergency distribution centers. And those are areas where multiple robots could make sense, but the environment is, is too messy or the upfront cost is too challenging for these uh, to be useful for them. And so I think where swarms fit in is a potential um, if we get this right out of the box solution uh, for these multi robot systems. So whereas typically in the real world, you know, people have key performance indicators, they want speed, they want low cost, all of that, that all, all of that is true. But I think in addition to swarms, if we can get to to the zeros, so the zero training, zero scaling effort, zero reconfiguration time, the zero infrastructure, I think those are the things where the messiness of the swarm all of a sudden is a benefit because it has this ability to react uh, to the world around it. Um, so I just want to walk you through a scenario because part of me was wondering if we could translate this to how would insects do it? And I, and I know they don't organize cloak rooms, but just conceptually, I thought that might be a fun, a fun exercise. So I just wanted to push, push this example a little bit. So imagine, imagine you're organizing a cloak room, a robot, a robot powered cloak room at a conference. Okay, say living machines in the future when it's in person. And people come up to, um, you know, and bring their suitcases and their jackets or whatnot. Well, in, in, the, in the old school centralized way of doing it, you know, you would have mapped the environment where your cloakroom is meant to be. You would have a robot that comes there, uh, not a robot, you would have a central station that's set up that controls all the robots. The user would come with their suitcase to the central station. The central station would say, okay, I'm allocating a robot and plan their trajectory to pick up the suitcase. The, the user would put the suitcase in and then they would plan the exact trajectory and they would tell that robot exactly where to put the suitcase. And then when the user comes back to retrieve their suitcase, there would be a plan, a database of where everyone's suitcase is. And so that central robot would say, okay, your suitcase is over there, direct a robot, bring the suitcase back. And then that user would get their suitcase. Now that could work, but it requires the mapping, it requires the comms, it requires the central system to work, it requires the database to be up to date. And if a user comes in and, and moves things around, then you end up with, with a bit of a challenge. I think the way a swarm would do this is, is you wouldn't even have a central pickup station. You would just delimit the area, maybe with some boundaries on the floor. Um, the user would come with, with their app um, and they would say, okay, I've got a jacket. And they would basically um, just call a nearby robot and the nearby robot would show up and they'd put their jacket in the box and scan a QR code. And then the robot in this environment would just move around randomly, potentially deposit their object, maybe near another object or maybe not near another object so you don't get crowding. Um, and then when the user comes back, um, they could come in from any point, they would get their app and transmit a message through the swarm saying, I'm looking for my jacket. And just like a human cloakroom, you know, we typically walk through the cloakroom and we're like, hey, Bob, have you found number 32? Well, that's what the swarm would do. They would, there would be enough of them uh, and their local perception would allow them to find that jacket quite readily and then navigate back to the user. So in that context, there is no database of where everything is, but we can quickly look up where everything is. There is no notion of central control. There is no map. Uh, the robots don't care where they deposit things potentially. And yet that system could work, I think, in a very, very organic way. I could imagine people walking through that environment, picking up their jacket if they see it earlier than us uh, or not. And so, the, you know, the notion of today's workshop of, of, of how do you make things move in real environments that are insect inspired? How do you get the cognition right so they can interpret the world around them. I, I think all of those capabilities are relevant when you distribute the intelligence um, through the system. So with this task in mind, uh, this distributed uh, organization, we've built a new platform um, that's that's uh, gonna be an open test bed. So if anyone's interested in using this, you're very welcome to. It's it's quite a fancier swarm. Uh, these robots are about, about this big. Um, but they've got they've got good processing power. They've got multiple cameras. They have eight, eight hours of lifetime. They're very fast, um, and they have laser time of flight range sensors as well. So we've got we've got more intelligence on board the individuals than what you typically have with swarms. But that's that's so that they can make sense of their environment and do some of these tasks. Now that doesn't mean that their behavior is very complex. So we could a lot of our behaviors still use random walk and just an opportunistic. Oh, here's a box. Let me pick this up and see if it might be the right box to deliver. Um, and we just ran an international competition with this new test bed with both simulation and just starting to get going with the real robots. And the Swarmanaut team uh, in Belgium won that. And you can see their, their behavior on the left where we're trying to move these boxes to one side of the environment. 
Now, th this is sort of getting us think about, well, how would the human, human then interface with this swarm? How would they control it and optimize their behaviors? And I also wanted to mention another human element, which we're starting to get out, and that's a swarm of little screen robots to help with screen uh, crap, to, with hu human crowds to make decisions or brainstorm. So here you see a little swarm where we're basically asking people in the mall, this was a month ago, uh, what they think we should do to fight climate change. And I think what's interesting here is typically when you have these difficult conversations, everyone's speaking in silos and, and that causes polarization and all of that. And what we're trying to do with these robots is have people put their opinion and then have their opinions travel and live on a little bit like opinion avatars um, so that people can see the opinions and, and it just gets people interested in, in interacting with the swarm. So I think we're trying to get um, some of these swarms out of the lab. Now, for the next three or four minutes, I also wanted to tell you about other swarms for people, which are tiny swarms, um, which, which um, have the potential to be useful in biomedical applications. So you, you might not think of nanoparticles or microparticles or cells as swarms, but I do because of the sheer number at which they operate. So nanoparticles for cancer treatment and injection typically has 10 to the power 13 particles, and their size makes them interesting to deliver vehicles uh, to tumors. And these particles come in different sizes, they come in different shapes, um, they come in different charges. You can basically um, program them through their material and their body. So you can activate them using magnetic fields or light. You can decorate them with molecules that allow them to bind uh, to things in their environment like each other or receptors on cancer cells. And actually, if you're a swarm roboticist, you realize these particles can sense their environment, they can act on their environment, the thing that they release could trigger another particle so they could communicate. And even though they can't you know, go left or right, like the flying robots that you saw in the very beginning, they can speed up and slow down by changing their diffusive properties. And so all of these parameters that change how they behave really changes their performance in a tumor. So we do a lot of simulations of where particles go in tumor tissue and if they stick to the right cancer cells and as well in microfluidics. And that whole notion of using machine learning now is also something that's allowing us to go from a tumor scenario to growing virtual tumors to basically chopping up these virtual tumors and trying to treat them with different particles and then seeing what particles and designs give us the best collective behavior uh, of those those large numbers of particles interacting now you might wonder how we control how we do the design of those nanoparticles that's usually the question i get and that's true of microparticles of cells. How do you engineer them? Well, it takes an expert a lot of years, typically, to engineer the individual capabilities uh, to do exactly what we want them to do. So while it's theoretically possible, it's typically quite challenging. And so with that in mind, we've built a new playground to start to control some of these nanomicrosystems so that we can see what parameters would give rise to interesting collective behaviors. It's, it's, this is all open source and you can make it yourself as well now for 700 pounds or so. And it's basically a projector with thousands of pixels and every pixel can project the size of a cell. And then it projects on a surface where you'd have a, a swarm or just a sample of lots of things. And then you have a camera and based on what we see on that camera, we can control what we project in the environment. And so as a proof of concept, here's some little uh, Volvox, they're little algae. And these algae, we're, we're projecting here communication halos on them. So we're tracking them, projecting blue light. And then when they enter the communication range of each other, they turn blue. So you can see this blue propagate. So this is one building block for swarming, which is communication. Here you're seeing stigmergy. So these, these Volvox now are depositing light in the environment. And interestingly, these Volvox react to light. So if you track this one, boom, it hits the light and it stops. So now we start to get an interesting stigmergic reaction. And we are also starting to see how we can control their motion. So here you can see we're zapping them, which stops uh, their motion, although it's not perfect. We, we're currently trying to figure out how to do this um, well. So, you know, can we control communication, stigmergy and motion of these microagents so that we get interesting behaviors? And the hope, the hope is yes, uh, but we'll, um, we'll have to see. We're, we're looking for people who have interesting things to put in our in our dome, it's called the Dome for Dynamic Optical Microenvironment. And we have a new project to think of other swarms. So you could think of, of tissue as, as, as a swarm. So can you drive wound healing by wearing one of these, these devices? This is, this is much further down the line. Could you treat cancer cells? So anything where you have a collective of many things and you wanna control their collective behavior using, using light 
is, is, is something that we're thinking of. And uh, just final thoughts. So we can, you know, if, if we do make these forms for people, as I mentioned, we'll need to find a way to make them trustworthy. And this is something that, that I think the, the robotics and AI community are, are starting to wrap their head around. And so we don't have answers yet, but we have questions. And here's a list of 10 questions that might be useful if you're thinking of putting swarms uh, in reality. So this, this is very um, cross-disciplinary. I'm very grateful to all my collaborators and co-supervisors who, um, who really co-supervise this fully because all of this work uh, involves different disciplines as well as, as the wonderful PhD students and postdocs who uh, did, all, did, did all the work. I've tried to mention their, their work on the slides as well. Thank you. Thanks, Sabine. That was a really lovely talk to, to wrap up the day. Um, so yeah, thanks very much for putting that together. Just before we get to the panel discussion, I thought I would throw in a quick question is that I thought it was really interesting that you were asking about the how people feel about swarms being navigating. And I wonder if there's something to be learned by the living machines approach, whereby all of these individual animals, the invertebrates that we've seen, they contain all the information in their brain to navigate and how to interact with the environment means that there's no sharing of information and that gets around a lot of these um, sort of centralized, you know, that people are taking camera images, they're offloading it to a, a server in another country. I mean, is that something that we can, you know, be using to put forward our methodology, do you think? Well, well, there's there's a big push for edge AI. And so anything that sounds like the computation is being done at the edge, which is on a robot in the robotics, robotics world, um, is a good thing, I think, in terms of, of avoiding that data, uh, get, get, getting pulled to places you don't want them pulled. So I think there, there is a positive aspect to that. The, the, uh, the downside might be just the, how do you give them confidence that the system is doing the right thing? So with, with the swarms, we're trying to figure out, do they trust a system that self-organizes? Are they happy in that cloakroom scenario, just being like, hey, you know, a robot is looking for your jacket. Is that good enough for them? Or, or do they want more information about where their jacket is and how it works? And you know, so I think it's sort of, um, yeah, give or take. I think it's good that it's on the robot for many things, but then we have to extract something for the user to, to get confidence. Sure. And I guess maybe after things like accidents, you know, if you can't understand what happened because the, you don't know how the robot's working, then it gets tricky. Yeah. So Alan Winfield has, um, and his collaborators have really nice work on on black boxes for for AI to be or robots to be able to understand what happened after an accident. And it could be that the swarm has a black box by monitoring what the swarm as a whole does and understanding the state of all the robots. So that that's something that that we need to think about. And I've just got one other question popped up in the chat. It says, "How could stake merger be applied to the larger multi-nodal robots in the large in a large environment?" Yeah, really good good question. So we're using Stigmergy in, in two ways in, in our current algorithms. And it's usually it's for area coverage in our case, rather than trail formation, um, as if, if you're thinking of pheromones. Um, so, so one example is we're currently doing um, fire monitoring and trying to cover very large areas at the scale of California. And there we're using Stigmergy on, on maps that the robots can share so that they avoid areas that have already been covered. I think in, in the box world, there's an interesting stigmergic reaction that when boxes are clustered, you, you, you need to mix them so that you don't block paths. So we basically have algorithms where like, oh, there's a box here and there's another one box here. This looks crowded. And then we, we move things, which is very, I guess, opposite that term I like, because we're not trying to build something. We're trying to break down clusters. But um, yeah, I, I think there's loads of ways we can use, we can use stigmergy. Perfect. So thanks very much for that. And I think in the interest of time, we should probably jump on to the panel discussion now. So thanks again for that talk. And I can direct anyone else with further questions, put them on the Discord server. Okay. So Nick, um, how, did we work out how we can have all the panel speakers together? Uh, so I'm working happen? on it. On my <laughs> end, I have all the speakers pinned, but I don't think that that is pinning them for anybody else. Okay. So maybe so, just the speakers then could um, unmute their microphones and show their, their screens. And I think that will automatically put them at the top. Yeah, that's a good point. That'll help too. Uh, so yeah, uh, we really appreciate everyone sticking around until the end. Uh, we, you know, as we pitch to all of you, you know, now for the audience's sake, you know, we really want to understand the pros and cons of working with invertebrates, what they can teach us uh, about neuroscience, about robotics, things of this nature, um, what kinds of things we think are limiting the field or what kind of uh, areas we can push into in the future. So of course, all of our speakers have done a wonderful job 
addressing these points throughout their talks all day long. Uh, so now we were hoping to have a, you know, a little more direct, uh, waxing philosophical type of conversation about some of these issues uh, so that we can uh, synthesize these ideas as a group. Uh, so uh, if you don't mind, I'm going to pose a question to the group. I'd say uh, feel free to, to chime in uh, you know, on the panel as, as you're comfortable. And uh, then if people have other questions or tangential points, by all means, uh, put them in the chat or uh, maybe politely interject so we can keep the momentum going. Uh, so I think uh, throughout the day, we saw a lot of really great examples of how experimental biology methods over the past 10 years have improved. You know, Barbara did an excellent summary, you know, things like um, connectomics have made a huge advancement, you know, optogenetics have, have been a crucial tool. Um, but I, I think a lot of us a lot of us uh, have not spoken too much about what improvements in robotics have happened maybe over the past 10 years that have made this a little bit easier, you know, in terms of actuation, sensing, and control. I mean, does anyone have any specific things they, you know, specific perspective they'd like to share about how the technical side of biorobotics has made it more practical to do this kind of research? If that makes sense as a question. <laughs> sure. So, so I think that, that that last robot I sh showed for the for the distributed organization is only possible now because components are enough cheap are cheap enough and good enough that we can start thinking of having powerful processors on board and good local sensing and and still scaling up to fifty robots in a, in in a smallish environment. So so I think all of those things weren't really possible before. There's still a lot of things that aren't possible. So. We're currently thinking about underwater robots and how to how to coordinate them in, in murky and turbid environments. And, and that project is fully with biologists studying fish because we don't know what sensor to design. So I think there, there, there's also lots of unmet need in the hardware where we, we, we need a lot of this inspiration still. Yeah, if I, if I might just comment on it as well. Um, I'm unmuted, yeah. Um, I, I for, for for my purposes, you know, I'm a I'm a biologist uh, by training and and do engineering by interest. Uh, and what's made it possible is the availability of relatively cheap, straightforward uh, components that allow that where where we're not trying to figure out how to make the optimum component and the optimum device, but we're trying to explore bigger issues that we want to implement on on fairly simple devices, and uh, and that's. It's been really, really helpful. You know, everything from Arduino and Raspberry Pi and, and then sensors and, and the miniaturization of all those components so that we can actually build them into something. And the other part, of course, is, uh, is the uh, 3D printing capability has made it possible to iterate designs relatively quickly. Uh, so, you know, in my field of soft robotics, we're still in the world of, of of exploring what might work. We don't have a really, really good framework for how to how to design something that is soft and is functional. So it's still in the process of well, build it and see. Uh, and uh, so that's really, really helped. Yeah, Holger, you've got your hand up. Just jump in. Yeah, I think there is really um, um, there is one sort of asymmetry in the in what we can learn from biology and what we have learned in a comparatively short time period. So we've learned a lot um, about the neuronal circuits. We have learned a lot about some of the general uh, principles in 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 uh, insect physiology, behavior, and and control, and so forth. But what we haven't been able to do and get into engineering really is the materials. I mean, there's one thing that's actually the, the way in which the brain works. But because we know that everything is embodied, to use that phrase, um, the, the way why biology can be really robust and efficient has to do not only with the, with the, with the, the features of the nervous system, but also with the features of the material. And that is I think still something where engineering is lagging behind. I'm not talking about the nanoscale maybe here, so that was a convincing talk, thank you. <laughs> but, um, but there is really something that we are missing to 
bring, so to speak, the full power to the road if we learn so much about the nervous system but cannot put it into, into robotic um, technologies that can keep up in terms of the materials? Uh, if I can add to that, I think the, the one thing when I started building underwater robots was coming up with an actuator that acted like muscle. And uh, there are very, very few things out there that act like muscle. And the one that we can use very effectively underwater is nitinol, which is the material they make heart stints out of. And we can both get it to uh, control the amplitude and velocity of contractions with motor neuron discharge patterns. Um, and until people come up with other artificial muscles uh, that can be used in air, et cetera, uh, I think that's just gonna profoundly limit the use of biological mechanisms to control robots. Well, we heard a number of people today. Oh, sorry, go ahead. Yeah, I just want to add on to that a little bit. Um, I, I think this is maybe a niche uh, uh, perspective, but um, in the world of legged robots that, that I work in, as well as my talk in flight, um, direct drive motors and the cheap accessibility of direct drive motors for torque control of legged robots, I think has been um, phenomenal. You know, sort of Songbei's MIT Cheetah, maybe 10 years ago, kind of started this, this renaissance of direct drive motors. And now there's tons of these robots where instead of sending a position command, we're sending force commands and we're directly controlling interaction forces with the world. And I think that that's just a really uh, fun way to think about um, uh, legged robots and, and the sort of bioinspiration and connections to biology uh, via you know, actuation through actuators rather than position controllers. Barbara, you raised your hand. Yes, so I, I... It might seem surprising for me to take account of you because you know I do I do believe that the the materials and the the physical substrate really is important part of of the control. But one of the points I was trying to make in in my talk is that there are things we see in the controllers that just seem to be common. You know they're common from from the centipedes through to the caterpillars through to the flying robot. You know flying flies and everything else. They have they have very similar brains. I mean, there's they're not identical. There are differences for sure, but there's a lot that's similar. And I think that's really promising for the idea that we could take some of this to robots. You know, the robot might have a completely different morphology as well, but these these principles will still actually be applicable. So I just want to sort of slightly counteract <laughs> that <laughs> the point of view that you know unless we can replicate the physical parts we can't we can't exploit these things i mean i'm not right. i know that's not what holger was claiming but i just no. you know no, um, no, I'm, I'm well totally agreed of course i mean but i was i was trying to get at the point where <clears throat> there is a mismatch between we can understand in terms of principles and how we could apply that in an energy efficient way like biology does it and that's missing in in, in engineering mm -hmm. I'm, I totally, I totally agree that the principles are very important, and in particular, in, in insects, it's so nice to see those sort of homologies or functional an analogies in terms of circuits and principles. It's really pretty, um, pretty amazing, and we can even make sense of it, which is even more amazing. So that's great, but I was just trying to point out that maybe. In, in a certain respect, the engineers are lagging behind when it comes to fully exploiting all the principles we can provide from biology. Can, can I, I, I don't want to jump in too much here, but I, I, I like a slightly different view of where the invertebrate stuff fits in because, and thank you very much for having a workshop specifically on that. Uh, but on the other hand, uh, I, I don't think of invertebrates being particularly a special group. Uh, they, they're animals. Um, you know, they're they're so incredibly diverse, uh, and you know, you could think of them as being most most animals are invertebrates, and then we've got a bunch of you know, furry, spined animals as well, and robotic, as roboticists and engineers, I think it really helps to pick. The, the model system that answers the questions you most easily want to answer. 
the reason invertebrates, I think, have been so in profoundly important in, in, in robotic research is because it's easier to answer the question sometimes working with an invertebrate than it is with a vertebrate. And that's all it is. The, functionally, I don't think there's a huge difference. I mean, you scale up perhaps when you get to, to many mammals and birds and reptiles, they're, they're scaled up in terms of the complexity of their nervous system or the number of neurons anyway. But I think the fundamental principles are the same. And, and to follow up on what Barbara just said, you know, if you look at the olfactory system in an insect, it's organized with glomerularly uh, in the brain and it's the same in a human. You know, we're organizing glomerularly. There's a fundamental principle somewhere in there. We still don't know exactly what it is. Um, but there's a fundamental principle that we can learn. So uh, I'd advise, you know, that we don't carve off invertebrate inspired robotics entirely from all robotics, because I think it's, it's part of a continuum. So um, I, I'd like to point out that the, the reason people started working on invertebrates in the late 60s was you, because you could uniquely re-identify neurons. And it's my point that until you can uniquely re-identify two neurons and study the connection between them, you can never reproduce an experiment. Yeah, you, that's so why you can't reproduce synaptic networks in mammalian cortex is because you can't uniquely re-identify neurons in cortex. And nobody's come up with a barcode. I'm sure there is a genetic barcode. And I think the work of... Uh, Oliver Hobart in C. elegans has really shown that there are these things called terminal selector genes that distinguish um, um, individual cells within C. elegans. And when we did a transcriptome of the lobster, we found many of the C. elegans terminal selector genes in lobsters, and they also exist in mice. So uh, and the other crazy thing that's going on right now is the work of Nick Straussfeld and, and uh, uh, Frank Hurth, uh, where they've shown that the genes that organize the central complex and the, the uh, uh, basal ganglia are the same in Drosophila and in mice. And in fact, they're expressed during the self-organization of those structures in the same temporal order. Um, so that, that, that really argues that all animals are the same, uh, pretty much. Um, but I think when we start talking about circuits, um, I, I want to know how you identified all the neurons in the circuit. I mean, that to me is really uh, uh, something that in the 70s, we spent all our time on. Um, that was the hardest thing to do was to uniquely say that I'm in these two cells. And when I go to this next animal, I can find the same two cells and perform the same experiment again. Yeah, so I, I think we still benefit from that and will continue benefiting from it in combination with Drosophila and its genome, uh, and its known, known genome. By the way, when we get back to locomotor control, Sam Grillner, who used to work on cats originally, gave up on cats because of the complexity and went to a very simple system like the Lamprey. And if you look at, when we saw the fantastic talk on um, centipodes uh, today, if you look at the pattern generators that are involved and the principles you find there in terms of acti activation of uh, waves and so forth, it's really, really similar. And it's, it's, it's amazing um, uh, what you find. And that's across phyla, in fact, and that's, um, that is definitely um, um, uh, uh, something one can exploit in terms of uh, going for the simple systems and learning for um, um, the general principles on biology. If I could ask a sort of follow-up question, I mean, Barbara uh, really nicely outlined the fact that we've got this connect dome coming and that's causing a big revolution. We've seen in deep learning, we've seen the availability of data and the ability to crunch that data has caused a revolution there. I mean, looking 10 years into the future, is there going to be, if you were to back a horse, is there going to be a new technology or something that we need for this community that's going to push us forward? I think Barbara maybe hinted at it, that maybe getting rid of this gap between the lab and the field might, might be the one in terms of the availability to look at animals in the field. I mean, it, I think it'd be very interesting, especially maybe for some of the researchers to, to have the input of where people see this going.
Yeah, Sabine, yeah, you can just unmute yourself and go. No, no, no one's willing to make predictions 10 years ahead because it's next being recorded. Time, next, <laughs> turn off the recording. <laughs> Same yeah, West. Not a prediction, but I, I think these new robots, if they have the ability to scale in numbers, I think that would be really exciting. So the production, how do you produce many of the robots that we're seeing in, in your videos with the brains that you're seeing? Because that then... That those agents have the potential to do things like environmental sensing, lots of applications that we've been talking about, but we can't because we can't scale up production of those really sophisticated new kind of bio-inspired bio robots. I don't know. That's just one, one thought. I, I, I actually like that point because I think it, it is a very important one that uh, the robots, in order to be, you know, really, really useful, they're going to have to be cheap. And... Um, you can produce some robot. I mean, we, we make robots for, you know, less than 10 bucks each. Um, you know, they're not high performing robots, but, uh, you know, they're, they're inexpensive. And, and with the miniaturization and mass production of, of, of things, you know, I, I'm always stunned that I can go out and buy for 50 bucks an incredibly sophisticated piece of equipment uh, that's being manufactured by the millions in the world. Uh, and uh, I think we're going to reach the point where once we have, robots doing useful things uh those factors are going to come into play we're going to have you know massive production of robots uh, that are very very cheap and um uh, easy to deploy and, and maybe also biodegradable I, i'm the well, more bio inspired yeah. materials and the muscles and all of that they'll need if we're going to scale them then they also need to be i guess greener that's uh something i did not talk about but there's something i'm actively keen on as to actually build most of the robot except for its brain out of uh, living tissue because I think um, that really is the a sustainable way to go forward um, instead of cluttering up the earth with uh, electric cars yeah yeah maybe I, I can add one point on that like I think as a roboticist uh, we are still stuck on one of the problem is not only actuators, but also energy efficiencies. So we, we, we still have a problem of these energies. Like if you look at small insects, you know, it can travel so far, so long distance, but for our robots, maximally you can run for half an hour or one hour, that would be great, right? And another point we are trying to look is like, for example, uh, when we start our down beta projects, uh, one of the questions is that uh, we, we just want to understand how, how such the animal, they, they, they know to form, you know, like the, the down pie into a ball and use that kind of the dynamic of the ball to roll the ball and then to, to transport that objects. So that, that's, we, we still unknown. We, we still don't know how, 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 how it can do exactly and how big of the ball should it form. And I think uh, one of the things we, we, we could look at is that the strategies that the insect use to, to, to exploit their, their body, their morphologies, and to, to do you know, like more complex tasks, and also, for example, transport the heavy, heavy object compared to the body weight. I think that that's still uh, you know, like a problem of us. Yeah, and I think that that fits in nicely with, you know, several of the talks we saw today, but especially thinking about dynamic scaling uh, with Nick Gravish and talking about quasi-static dynamics and morphological computation from Barry's talk, right, that ultimately there is a lot of integration, right? All of these systems have evolved to integrate with one another, and they're all highly nonlinear, and they're all super high-dimensional. Uh, I mean, are there, you know, I think all of us have, have kind of leaned into the biological realism of many of these systems, but that comes with a cost of dimensionality and nonlinearity. I mean, do we, is, is this fundamentally a making the job harder than it needs to be? Or by digging into these details, are we uncovering these underlying principles that actually will lead to further insights? Any thoughts? I, well, I have another uh, big issue I'm quite interested in. Uh, almost everybody controls robots algorithmically with computers. Uh, the nervous system doesn't have an algorithm processor in it. It controls things with networks of neurons that have dynamics that enables those, those networks to have certain properties. And uh, I think that 
you know, the first approach, the algorithmic approach is artificial intelligence and the network approach is biological intelligence and they're really quite different. And we need a, a way to reconcile those two approaches. I think that's a really fundamental issue. And if we really wanna make biomimetic robots, um, they need to have a nervous system that's made up of, of uh, neurons and synapses. Well, I mean, I think a lot of the work that was presented here and a lot of other work in the field is in that direction. I mean, for example, Barbara's networks are all dynamical neural systems. Do you care yeah. to speak to that, Barbara? No, I, I agree. I, yeah. I, I, guess, I guess the question is, you know, do we want hardware neurons, which I think, you know, does maybe speaks a little bit to this energy thing as well, that brains are just, you know, are, are just more efficient than, than binary processes. And we're simulating brains on binary systems that use a lot of energy to be binary. Um, so I think there's there's some interesting yeah. things there. You know, if you want to get to energy efficiency, we probably have to start moving away from being one layer away. You know, we, we might be looking at the neural processes, but then when, when we run the neural processes, we don't run them on the same mm -hmm. kind of hardware. Yeah, I guess that's one of the problems with machine learning and everything. I mean, there, there's a lot to be said for machine learning, that's for sure. You can, if you have a problem, a mapping problem or something like that, you get it solved. If you have enough late uh, data and if you train your, net, your nets or whatever you use well enough, but that's very different from the networks that biology is using. They need some learning and plasticity as well. But the process that is actually specifying the, the state of the system can change on in an ongoing process and doesn't require tons of data um, um, to, uh, to start with. And that is, makes really a big difference because the, the, the computing power and the energy you, you, you require with more um, probabilistic um, um, approaches um, is probably way bigger than uh, what you could achieve with biological circuits and and some uh, and some of the architecture we find yeah. in animals i think someone someone tried to calculate the average energy use of a deep learning paper and it was quite scary actually <laughs> but you know there, there's another issue i would like to raise in, in this discussion like if you, if you look at the field of neuromorphic computing which is now around for 35 years or something like this they just advance very slowly. And yes, there are advances, but they're very slow. So if we want to identify principles to make that discovery pipeline dependent on this very slowly evolving hardware, we're not going to move very fast, right? So I think we also have to be pragmatic and we might have to see in terms of future applications, we might have to find com compatible substrates, both for bodies and for computation, but to explore and identify those principles, maybe we should just use the best technology we have, which is unfortunately digital, but, but we should not see that as a problem, right? If that's a tool that helps us, then we use that tool and we, we move on. But what I see more as a fundamental challenge here is that I think we have not been advancing enough in our thinking about what these nonlinearities in these nervous systems really actually mean. So, for instance, in terms of representational substrates, uh, and that was just a little bit, I touched upon that in my own talk, it seems these representational substrates in biological systems are not fixed. They are very flexible and adaptive, and you might go from, let's say, rate-coded systems to more temporal-coded or face-coded uh, solutions within the same nervous system. And, and that's something we, we barely, barely understand. Right, so and I feel that these are very fundamental questions we should just be attacking um, without worrying too much about the hardware we have today to deal with it. <laughs> yeah, I think that's a really good point, Paul. That kind of fits in with what we were talking about earlier with uh, off-the-shelf components, right? If the computer is the off-the-shelf nervous system, maybe that's what we're stuck with for the moment. Uh, I'm only interjecting because uh, the organizers have asked that we exit this breakout room and go back to the main session so that they can make us hosts and we don't have to shut the whole party down. Uh, so thank you to everyone who's participated so far. Uh, we're just going to boot everybody into the main Zoom room and we can continue talking. Uh, or if people have other appointments, of course, they're free to go. So thank you very much, everyone.
guess I just have to leave uh, the breakout room. Wonderful. Uh, yeah, sorry, did that effectively uh, kill the momentum? So, <laughs> yeah, I, I can try and build it back up. So I think one of the interesting um, kind of aspects here is if we had a robot that could do everything that we've seen a robot do, that would be a very impressive robot. Um, but one of the problems I think we have right now is kind of scaling up our behaviors and kind of combining behaviors from yeah. different research, um, right? So we've got a lot of robots that can do impressive things, but I think a lot of our algorithms are kind of still incompatible with each other, right? We can't like bring them all into one system and like certain robots are designed to be impressive at a sp specific thing and It'll mm -hmm. never, you know, somebody can, you know, quadrupedal robot is great, but it'll never be able to manipulate an object um, as, as it's just got these, you know, four sensor feet. Um, and so I think that's kind of maybe somewhere too where we need to like build out a real, um, nervous system like framework of kind of components that can build with each other. So you're well, talking about systems integration. Yeah. They well, have to... under, there are two things I, I would add to that. On the one that I think the field could profit a lot if we would have some standards with respect to the robots so that we actually can compare the the, the neural the neural yeah. Mimetic control systems that we are advancing because now often it's very sort of customized and yeah. very difficult to compare anything so i think we, we also have to standardize the bodies if you want why don't we standardize or well, let's say one quadruped and one quadcopter and yeah. <laughs> and what have you so this could be this is one issue we have to solve following up a little bit on the animal uh, ro uh, animal robot olympic uh, type of benchmarking ideas or mm -hmm. RoboCup, right? So I think this is one thing we should advance, that we start all having, like also in our case, we print our own little robots and it's all fine for certain experiments. Nothing generalizes. I cannot mm -hmm. give anything to anyone. And I think that's not good enough. And then yeah. the same holds for the way we model these control systems. We do have to start to maybe converge a little bit on, on, on standard, let's say, libraries that, that at least give us a chance to make things more comparable replication is often very difficult because things are not fully shared you know then people might use different environments for the simulation i think there's real progress be, being made in the field of computational neuroscience but maybe it's not bad to, to really set up some some task force in this community on, on standards like that we just say okay take take the mushroom bodies fantastic fantastic study by by barbara well, maybe we have to look at sort of standard implementations that we can start to share and also experiment with along the standard set of robot morphologies we could experiment with. Yeah, I think a benchmarking framework is one of the things very high up on the uh, wish list in a way. Because, I mean, this is one thing um, to compare uh, functional capability or to just give a qualitative video demonstration or something like that, or give some hard numbers where you compare some biologically inspired principles with engineering solutions. And then you can basically point your finger at it and say, okay, this is where biology, biological principles are just better or consume less energy, say. Right, uh, Barbara raised her hand. Yeah, Barbara. <laughs> Yeah, I'll be a little bit devil's advocate again. I, I don't disagree at all that, that, you know, some kind of quantification and comparison and, and indeed sharing is, is really needed and is a good thing. I'm a little bit more wary of the idea of having 
you know, something like RoboCop or whatever, that's a, a kind of a, a shared goal, a, a standard that we're all trying to work towards, because what, what you see happen there is that people end up working towards that specific set of rules, that specific target, and they just lose sight of doing more creative work, if you like, of finding more creative things. So um, I think unless, you know, I, I think it's fine for people to agree that, you know, there's something we maybe want to solve. And if you want to have robots be useful, I think that's important that, you know, then you just have to say, well, here's something like self-driving cars. That's that, that was a very clear target and it really drove a lot of fantastic research. But I think I don't want that to be an artificial, you know, we, we set up a little Olympics that we're going to say, this is what we want our robots to do. It needs to be either a real task or we should have, we should be exploring as many different things as we like. But exactly. You could have a catalog with uh, criteria where you compare your, uh, your new design with uh, some conventional design and not just one or just one competition. So mm -hmm. that's that's very clear that it, it has to be a little bit more than just kicking a football or so. Yeah, uh, Sabine has her hand raised. Yeah, I, I I was so I think that is a good idea to integrate the different capabilities, but I, I also think it's useful to embrace the hyper specialism of some of these mechanisms because they're very you know fit for purpose in specific areas and areas where potentially no robot exists. So if you, if you manage to build. I don't know, floating little bubble bots that are inspired from jellyfish or something that have one trigger, neural trigger to sense one specific thing and light up. That that would be an interesting task and bio-inspiration that you wouldn't necessarily want to translate to something else. But it's these niches where, where some of the power is, I think, in, in these in these methods as well. I apologize, I have to jump out because because Kiro just came home. But... Thank you so much for your participation, Sabine. Take care. And uh, Tony has his hand up too. Perhaps Tony has left us. Tony lost interest. Yeah. What are you going to do? <laughs> but so, I was not making an argument that we all should be should be sort of solving specific benchmark tasks, right? But I think some forms of standardization where we say, look this is established in our field and now we can go to the next step take something like foraging foraging is a kind of task many of us actually engage with in one form or the other to have a more standard and also quantitative specification around that i think also linking to the ethology here would actually be very useful yeah or mate yeah so <clears throat> I, I have been also discussed about this issue with also many of my colleagues who are, you know, like engineer from engineer perspective. So they, they also, they question me is like, okay, you guys, we are doing like bio inspired robot. And uh, okay, why, why don't you just use, you know, like engineering solutions? How, how can you compare? And I think this is the, one of the, the issue that we, we, we should think of. How can we, you know, like use any kind of metrics to, to, to evaluate, to, to, you know, to judge how good it is of the bio-inspired methods. So, so uh, one of the metrics we have used, for example, like specific resistance, you know, like just to show like how the robot can do, you know, like energy efficient uh, behaviors. Okay. But I, I think maybe we, it, it would be nice to have this kind of catalog, you know, like we, we go to our list of this catalog and, and then we can check, you know, like, and, and we can, compare and validate our result compared to the others. Yeah. Tony, you're back. What you got for us? Uh, yeah, sorry, um, I had internet issues. Um, so I, I'm sorry if I missed a bit of discussion earlier, but um, so I wanna um, make a plea that we think more about individual cells because um, you know, most of evolutionary time was about uh, evolving the single cell, and it's only really the last uh, 500 billion years to 700 million years where we've had multi-celled animals. And if you look at the um, genetic machinery that builds nervous systems, uh, most of it is co-opted from uh, genetic machinery that does intracellular mechanisms like metabolism. And if you look at uh, single-celled animals, You've got some remarkable range of behavior. You know, you have lots of swimmers, 
you have lots of uh, foragers, you have uh, um, uh, things that uh, animals that eat other animals, you can have an animals that can detach from a substrate and move and find another location and attach. You've got single celled animals of a range of sizes. I think the biggest one is maybe a meter. Um, and when we look at multi celled animals, of course, they're built out of these single celled components. Uh, and uh, we focus on the neurons, but we tend not to think so much about the other ones uh, a lot of the time. And of course, when you, when you build multi celled animals, you have to really start again in terms of building your communication mechanisms because you've got to communicate across the membrane, which is a barrier. For, for, for a lot of things. So um, there is a, a really exciting revolution going on, I think, in intracellular biology of understanding how gene networks uh, generate behavior in cells. And I, I wonder if uh, we could reach out to that community a bit more and get them involved with what we're trying to do. Yeah, and I think that really plays into some of the other issues that have been raised about things like materials and construction, where if you want to grow a machine, you need to understand how those genes interact and how, they, um, how they're expressed and whatnot. The potential of synthetic biology to reprogram cells is, is enormous. Uh, and so for uh, biohybrid technologies, this, this is presumably the way to go. I'm sure people like Barry know more about this than I do. The, I, th I think the huge challenge, I agree with you, Tony, but I think that the huge challenge is that we really don't understand the bit between the genetics and the final assembly. Uh, you know, the, talking about, you know, gene genes make proteins ultimately, right? And that's it. They don't make, they don't actually directly make a finger of a certain length or an eyeball. Um, and it's that problem that we have yet to solve with if we really wanted to design and build robots. I don't think anyone can tell you uh, which genes you need to alter in order to make a person's finger be half as long again, right? Uh, morphology is not encoded in, in the genes directly. It's in networks of interactions and with the environment. So, you know, I think the work of, of Mike Levin and people like him are, is is where that's going to go. Um, so I, I think actually robotics and biotechnology are are headed on to become a, an entire field in, in themselves. You know, it's been advertised in science fiction for a long while, right? That we have humanoid and bio devised machines. It's out. It's obviously going to go that way. We're just a long way from that. I think what I'm interested in trying to do is figure out if we can <clears throat> um, do the first stage, which is figure out how how we might actually make one of these things work appropriately if we could make it. Um, so that's where my interest lies, but uh, yeah. yeah. I, I, th I think, um, I mean, uh, hopefully the sort of same or some similar self-organizing principles are operating uh, intracellularly as extracellularly in multi-celled animals. And, and I think uh, you, you're right to say, well, I think that this is the right level at which to attack this problem. You know, sort of worms and caterpillars might be a good way in. Uh, to, to understand these, these self-organizing processes generally. But another approach might be to start within the cell uh, at the non-neural mechanisms of communication and actuation as well. It's a remarkable actuation mechanisms in single cells uh, and compartmentalism and all this and sort of... Uh, so uh, it would be really interesting to, to think about those structures and how we can start to build uh, artificial agents that have that richness of detail uh, at, at the component level, which is what I think you could do with biohybrids. Paul, what are your thoughts? Well, so what I so I, I completely disagree with Tony <laughs> about going intracellularly. Uh, I think that will be a step backwards, Tony. We want to go forward? Okay. <laughs> so, and also your claim that it would just generalize. Okay, I would like to see the data behind that, but okay, it's, it's as a hypothesis, completely fine. But I, I see an opportunity here, maybe for our next, uh, next living machine event, we should really have a dedicated session, really inspecting these, these boundaries but between, let's say the biorobotics and, 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 and the biology here, 
Um, so I, I would be very, very interested in contributing to at least organizing it, get the experts together from these two domains to see where, where the sweet spots are. Because now, of course, we're all guessing. Mm -hmm. I could imagine we could exploit also developments in organoids, right? There are, uh, there are also a progress, there's progress on neural organoids. I think it's extremely interesting to start to see how we can interface those to, to actuate actuated systems. So uh, th yeah. I see many opportunities, but this is, this is a field that we have to explore. So it's a fantastic suggestion. So shall we, shall we agree to, to have a little task force on pushing that for our next living machines that we really have a dedicated session just inspecting this? Does that make sense? Checking on tissue engineering, for instance, as one example. But there is actually, I mean, there is a link between neuroscience and chemical computing as well. Very clearly, I think um, Simon Laughlin um, um, was mentioning that in, in, in his book on basically the design of nervous systems as well. And if you think about it, a lot of mechanisms like amplification and sensors and so forth, it's all chemical. It's not even electrical, but uh, so we need that sort of chemical component there anyway. Yeah, and I would disagree, Paul. I mean, if you look at um, uh, actuation within cells, it's the same kind of proteins that are providing actuation uh, in cells as are providing actuation in muscles. So a lot of the things do translate across. I think it's something like a third of the uh, uh, genes that are involved in specifying the nervous system are involved in specifying uh, intracellular processes. So it's yeah, an incredible no, amount. So that's a mechanism that builds brains, builds, builds cells and one yeah, cells. But if you can control, let's say, ATP in a single cell, doesn't mean you have, you have an actuated uh, skeletal muscle system, right? There yeah, are but, different levels of organization that we also have to respect. You can move, you can, you can sense, you can detach from a substrate, you can swim to another place, you can anchor yourself again. Uh, you can be a predator, you can do all these things as a single cell. Um, and what's happened in, in multicellular biology is we've actually have a convergence. We have animals that are single celled. Uh, and of course, we have swarms at the uh, single cell level as well, which have really rich behavior as well that we, we barely understand. Uh, and uh, no, we're, we're trying to recalculate thinking about the first three, three, three million billion years. So. That looks great. I would go for it. But I just wanted to highlight there might be other routes to, to advance in this domain, for as I was thinking about going the organoid route, this might be an alternative, right? To try to link these domains together. Yours is one path, but there might be others. So this is more or less, that's more the point I was trying to yeah, push here. Yeah. So Paul, Paul, I think uh, if you're looking for people to help advise or organize such a thing in terms of, you know, what, what I think of as robots that really are living, actually made of living tissue, uh, I'd, I'd be happy, happy to help. I, I'm not an expert in that directly, but I know people that are in that area and can sort of help work with that because it's, it's fascinating and, and uh, requires an enormous range of different disciplines to really start to get to grips with it. And I, I think the robotics community is, is one of those parts of the, of the puzzle that's not been used as much as it should. Fantastic, Barry. Um... Absolutely. And also anyone else, if you have, are interested in contributing to organizing this, um, drop me a mail and for sure we're going to go for it. I'm still working on this one. I can't see nothing. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, wonderful. I mean, uh, I think this might be as good a place as any to draw an official line you know, ending the session. We're, uh, we're only 30 minutes over, but, uh, you know, I think it's, it's been a long day for us. So I, I really, really appreciate everyone's participation. I think this has been a really uh, wonderful group to get together. And I think there've been a lot of really great insights and synthesis. So uh, thank you all for your participation. And uh, I guess we'll see you all tomorrow at uh, 1300 UTC for the final set of workshops. And uh, I don't know. Take care, everyone. Thank you. Thanks very much. Bye. Thank you, yes. Thank you very much. Bye. Thank you. Thank you very much. See you all. Was well, was a great workshop, guys. So thank you very much for putting that together. Thanks, Wonderful. Paul. That's the kindest thing you've ever said to me. <laughs> <laughs> That's the competition. Have a weak moment. 
I have a weak moment. Don't you yeah, better no. better enjoy it now. I and will. I'll lock it away in my, in my brain. Yes. Nick, you've hey, got Tony, I, I'm shocked that you want to go all intracellular now. What's wrong? No, I, I, like I, a regression. <laughs> like, okay, I, 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 we failed on the brain. We failed on everything else. Okay, now we go into a cellar because that's simple, but it isn't. It's not simple. It's complicated. I'm saying that it, it, it's at least historically the, the, it precedes the multicellularity and we haven't understood it. So it's a bit you know, of a leap to think we can understand multicelled animals when we don't know what the building blocks are and how they work. So you know, that's... Encapsulation. That, that's Tony, the, well, Tony. He, yeah, but we, there's a lot to learn from the single cells. Um, I mean, I think we, okay. and also there's a revolution in that field. I've been reading up about it. You know, cellular computing is massive. Um, okay, look, we're going to do a podcast interview on that. Okay, well, we should I, get... I completely disagree. So uh, I, I know really very little about it, but I'm sure I can find somebody to speak to it. Uh, Joe, well, you can bring your lawyer, no problem. No, it's looking a bit non <laughs> I think Joe about uh, looking subcellularly. <laughs> okay. No, Joe, you're you're muted. Joe, you're muted. But while Joe's muted, I'm going to say my buys. I need to go and see the kids. So they're they're running wild. <laughs> she does everyone. Oh. Um, I think if we want to get into engineering cells, I am I not unmuted? Yeah, you are. You can. So am I, am I, okay. If we want to get into engineering cells with synthetic biologists, we really need to talk to synthetic biologists that work on yeast. Because the thing that really distinguishes prokaryotes, which is what 90% of synthetic biologists work on, and, um, and um, eukaryotes, of which yeast is, is the presence of endoplasmic reticulum and G protein coupled receptors. Yeah. For sensing, G protein coupled receptors are absolutely essential. They don't exist in bacteria. And 99% of, of people at work that do synthetic biology do it in bacteria and not in yeast. And it, it re yeast really makes a difference. Um, and uh, that that's a fundamental issue. Yeah, I, I agree. We, we need to understand the eukaryotes. I mean, I think that's where the interesting uh communication and actuation stuff is happening uh intracellularly and uh, obviously all, all the larger uh single-celled animals are eukaryotes so so those are the ones to look at but i mean i i was struck by the convergence between what uh, these larger single-celled animals do and what some of the you know smaller invertebrate species do essentially they're solving the same problems uh but obviously the uh the single cell animals are doing this in, uh, without neurons. The, the well, one of the interesting things is paramecia um, basically thinks with its cell membrane. Yeah. And it's got one end that has calcium channels, the other end has potassium channels. When they get poked on one end, they back up. When they get poked on the other end, they speed up. Um, so they're thinking with their with one cell membrane and behaving profoundly. And uh, do, do you know um, biologists that are sort of unpicking this and, and working out the sort of the gene networks and the protein uh, sort of systems that are generating that? There's a, quite a literature on it. It originally was done by Roger Eckert. Right. I'm just wondering if anybody is, is looking at this sort of from a sort of living machines perspective towards sort of building embodied. Uh, I, I can look or, into it. Yeah, yeah. That would be really that would be really good. Well, really good to somebody uh, doing the genetics of it. Yeah. Okay, so look, this is this is a good starting point, but um, on the other hand, we, we also have to look at this multi-scale organization of biological systems, where in multicellulars, of course, you also get encapsulation of function um, that you don't always have to reduce all the way back to to the intercellular processes. So that there, there is a, a structuring of, of function that we shouldn't lose sight of here, I would say. But, okay, let's, let's develop this. It, it sounds like a great, a great concept, even though I completely disagree with Tony, but that has other reasons. Um, I, yeah, Brian Cox, uh, it might be, who said that the reason is we haven't found real life forms yet. 
is because the eukaryotic cell is so unique in the universe that um, uh, one cell absorbed another and the other cell became a symbiote living inside that cell, but brought its gen uh, genes with it. Uh, and that's what you have with mitochondria. And that's a unique event in evolution. It only happened once on planet Earth. Uh, and all multicelled animals are built out of these eukaryotic cells. And, and yet here we are building models of animals and we, and we, we pay relatively little attention to what's happening uh, intracellularly in all of the cells they're made from. Right. It's particularly interesting that you're, you're sharing this with us sounding as if you're speaking from a bathtub. <laughs> <laughs> your gain is very high. Is it? Like Sorry. Oh, yeah, you're, so you're overdriving your, your amplifier. Uh, that, I that's can... all right, Tony. I know it's very important what you're saying. It's fine. So, <laughs> but look, um, but are you linking this also to your ideas on self? Or is it independent? Uh, I am. Is that better? I've automatically adjusted my volume. Um, so uh, I've been reading a book. I can't remember the author who claims that uh, single-celled animals have a sense of self. Uh, I don't think I agree, but uh, I have to know more. But okay. I think uh, I mean, single-celled animals clearly have uh, agency. They clearly have a boundary. These are two of the things you need to have to, to be a self. But I don't think they have any... Uh, self-awareness so that's that's a line i would draw probably quite high up the sort of uh phylogenetic. right okay but you know i but, but i was um, but i was thinking about in these workshops is which part of this discussion could we have had 10 years ago when we started with living machines and which part would we not have been able to have and and i'm not sure it it's very balanced you know yeah. Most concerns are concerns we seem to struggle with almost since single-cellar organisms emerged. So, so, so the, there are a lot of re reoccurring themes on which we're just not making real progress. And I, I think we, we should pay closer attention to this to understand why are we keeping, you know, slamming our head against the same wall for so long. Like, again, we talk about hardware. Again, we talk about or oh, the computation should be analog and, and neuromorphic or not, and so on. Uh, still, we're looking at robots that in some sense look all like, so at least several of them look more like hobby projects than, than advanced technology. Yes, they make a point. Great, I get it. But I feel, I, I'm not sure. We, we're, we're, there is some invisible boundaries we haven't identified. And we keep on bumping into them without really putting a clear flag there and say, look, guys, collectively, you must overcome this. Well, I mean, we, we, we are building um, our model organisms out of electronic neuro nervous systems, uh, talking to uh, really sort of dead materials, which is uh, all the actuators and, and mm -hmm. parts. And that is a big difference from... Uh, from no, but the, that's why I raised it, right? So maybe the issue you now raised, Tony, that we also discussed here in this session to take living machines more literal, maybe that's actually one of these invisible boundaries we have been bumping into that we always thought we could emulate that using dead materials. Maybe that has been one of our mistakes that we have this simplifying assumption we could emulate our way through this. And maybe there we have to push harder than we've done so far. So I, 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 one of the things I got out of Sabine's talk was this idea that you, know, you have these, um, nanoparticles uh, and you know they can actuate they can communicate they can do all these things and obviously you know there's no control of that so i think that's part of the mindset set that we have to change is thinking that uh you know control intelligence uh means uh it, well you know, there's a whole lot of computational uh, uh, morphological intelligence stuff written but i think you know th thinking about these intracellular mechanisms are ultimately mm -hmm. Uh, it, it comes down to chemistry and proteins and uh, and movement, you know.